All right, just wanted to give a little quick update here on the book. The book is really turning out, um, really turning out good. Um, gotten through a lot more, a lot faster than I had originally thought that I would. So that's really awesome. Um, I mean, the subject matter is definitely a very serious subject, a very serious topic, one that can get easily confused one that can be easily misinterpreted and of course the propaganda is real <laughs> this we know and the propaganda all surrounds it's all surrounding um, around the uh, theory that uh, David Crowley is guilty when obviously he has never been proven guilty cannot be proven guilty and never will be proven guilty so therefore then the question is why are we acting like he is guilty why should we believe that he is guilty when there's no evidence that shows that he is um, so that's where we are uh, that's where we were five years ago and that's where we're gonna be five years from now most likely um, unless we can get the case reopened and I think we need to do whatever we can to try to get the case reopened. There is no failure. Failure is not an option in this case. Uh, by keeping the case going, by keeping the truth alive, um, that is a victory. Every day is, a, is a, another victory for us. When we make sure that we are fighting for truth, that we are letting people know that we are not going to just go quietly into the night that we are going to be here until it can be proven that David Crowley is guilty or until the case is reclassified renamed whatever you want to call it um, until that day it's just uh, we're not going anywhere we're not going to be silenced we're not going to be bullied we're not going to be stopped the truth is on our side the truth is not on the side of the Apple Valley Police and their fictitious conclusion that David Crowley is guilty and a conclusion based solely on the fact that they can't find anyone else they they didn't look for anyone else so if you don't look you won't find so I think they're hoping that a lot of people will just not look for the truth will not look for what happened in this case and that this case will simply die off Gray State team can then go and make money off of David Crowley's work and can uh, pretty much accomplish what they've been accusing us of doing for the last four or five years. So um, it's not, you know, the burden of proof is on the uh, accuser. It's not on us. It's not a, well, if we can't prove David Crowley, we can't prove anybody else, then it must be David Crowley. Truth doesn't work like that. It really doesn't. And I know some would like it to work like that, or that's the only thing that, that they can do is just say, well, if, if you can't prove anybody else did it, then it must be David. That's lazy. That's lazy. Um, it's not truthful. It's bullshit. And um, it, can be, it can be frustrating because obviously um, there's a lot more to this. Now, we could get way off into theories and everything, but you have to remember the official theory is a conspiracy theory because you have all of these people conspiring uh, to accuse David Crowley of being guilty. So, yeah, that frustrates me too. The whole pack theory thing. Well, that would be a conspiracy between David and his wife to kill their daughter and kill themselves. No proof of that either. But it hasn't stopped many people from trying to keep those uh, fictitious lies to keep those lies going for whatever reason, for whatever purpose. I don't know what the purpose is, but I know that it's not true. Uh, there's a few things in this case that we do know are true. What is in, in the document, what the DNA tests show, what the autopsies show, and none of it really, really shows you uh, why David Crowley is obviously guilty. Therefore, it leads back to the question is um, that he's not, right? <laughs> so the David Crowley questions will continue. This story will live on. And I do believe that one day justice will be served. Justice will come. It's just a matter of time. And it's just...
just a matter of getting the right people into the right places and putting the right puzzle pieces into effect. So we've been in the Justice for David Crowley Facebook group, we've gotten a lot of people that are commenting, that are um, sharing their views, sharing their ideas and researching. And that's very powerful because we need that. We need real researchers. We need real people who are gonna um, spend some time sincerely trying to find out the truth here not just focus on some of these wedge issues and some of the issues that really don't don't really matter or just are just there to distract us there to de deter us and are there to intimidate us and none of that's going to work it hasn't worked yet it's never going to work and we're going to make sure that it doesn't work so um, I want everybody to keep up the good fight. Don't for, forget what the purpose of the group is, what our goal is, what our mission is. It's very clear, and that's been that's been true ever ever since this case started. You know, it's never been about a conspiracy theory or uh, the government killed David or anything like that. It's always been just about what they say, what the evidence points to, and where we go from, from there. So that's where I'm focused, and I hope that's where all of our good researchers are focused too. There's nothing wrong with going with your gut and thinking, well, you know, man, I've looked at everything, and I really think this is what happened. I really think, um, you know, this theory is accurate. That's fine. Follow that trail. Follow that rabbit hole, because there seem to be many rabbit holes, many spider webs. case. Whew, it's been a long one. Five years. Five years. And we have made progress. we made a lot of progress. And we will continue to make progress as long as we don't give up. As long as we don't stop. As long as we don't give in to the bullshit theories. As long as we don't give in to the distractions, um, stay focused on it, stay focused on the facts, stay focused on the case, stay away from toxic people, stay away from the, from the people that are obviously just there just to, just to stir up crap, those people are always going to be around, and uh, this case is way too important to put any type of focus, any type of meaningful thoughts onto such uh, just ignorant behavior ignorant behavior and thankfully that is a very very small portion of people uh, so we're not I'm not worried about it I don't think anybody else is really worried about it either it's just it's just what whatever whatever it is whatever they want to do wherever you want to go go with it I'm gonna go towards truth and I'm gonna keep seeking that the uh, like I said, the book, you know, I've gotten a lot further on this book right now than I thought that I would be. I'm in the final stages, really, here. So much so that I might even have time. I know I'd like to have the book out uh, by January 17th. I might even have time to have an audio version out by that time. Maybe. Maybe. Because <clears throat> I would like an audio version of, of the book. Maybe each chapter broken up into its own audio section or something I'm not really sure but a few months ago that didn't seem like I was gonna have time for that didn't seem like that was gonna be a possibility for maybe another year or so but like I said you know I mean the book um, the latest draft with with all the with the research documents it's a uh, 262 pages so it's not it's not a hard read um, it's not, you know, I mean, a lot of people should be able to get through it quickly. I think a lot of it will be just regurgitated stuff that everybody's already heard. Obviously, if, if you've read the documents, if you've read anything that I've written, posted, uh, the videos, all that, I mean, you pretty much already know what's in the book. There's not going to be any big hidden secrets or anything like that. And it's not meant to be. It's meant for researchers. It's meant for people who want to get quickly caught up on this case. It's meant for um, as a reference guide. And I hope it, I really hope it's one day it's going to get put into the right person's hands that's going to say, you know what, we need to look into reopening this case. And that includes law enforcement of some kind. 
um, somebody in, in, in a government spot, I don't know, someone who can, who can help get the case reopened. That's what I pray for, and that's what I would ask people to pray for, to get this into the right hands. Um, like I said, it's just a matter of time. We've, we've already we've already had victory over victory over victory because we keep the case going, and we don't just settle for laziness, for the lazy investigation. We read the documents. We know what's, what's in there. We know what the DNA tests show. We know what the officials say when they talk about they went through everything and couldn't find motive, couldn't find any motive, any reason why this happened. It's a big, big deal. So, um, it's, yeah, it's just been, it's been quite the, quite the journey and I'm looking forward to seeing where this case goes from here. So, we are, like I said, we're in the final, final steps of the book it's pretty much just you know maybe one one more proof and then finalizing the artwork and all that and should be good to go it's all done already and i'm uh I'm, I'm happy with it i'm happy to get this part this part done because this is like a big hill it's just a big a big mountain to to climb and i think it's gonna be um it's gonna take a lot of that burden off of, off of me and I hope it helps people. I really do. I really do hope that it helps. And I hope it's not uh, confusing. <laughs> but I hope it's a good resource. Um, a good book for resources. So people can just get caught up quickly on this case. Because we do have many people continually, even, even now, new people coming to this case. Wanting to learn about... Uh, what people's views are and why they believe this, why they believe that. So um, we need that. We need, you know, I'd like to see other books too. I, I don't, I don't think that just because I've written one book, I don't think that this should be the only book out there on the Crowley case. So I hope that other members of the other group, other truth seekers, people that are looking for truth, will consider writing their own book on this case too. This very powerful case and um, this very. Um, disturbing a very disturbing case when you look at the way that David Crowley was handled and the way that this whole case was handled is not how investigators should handle a case like this so quickly and that's one of the biggest things and I, I hope that they learn from that I really do I hope that other investigators look at what they did wrong and don't make the same mistakes that they made so that's uh, that's what I really hope I really hope that that happens now uh, I, we're going to do another live show this Sunday coming up this Sunday at 1pm Pacific time this will be on the Gray Stage YouTube channel and we're going to try to go over the note, the notebook, the notebook, notepad, notebook, whatever you want to call it, in David's office, the one that had the writing um, submit to all and now in the rise most latest version. So there are 59 pages. This was an 80 page notebook and there's only 59 pages in it. There's blood on several pages, blood on more pages than I thought, blood on more pages that is actually mentioned in the um, final reports so it's very important to look at these and see where the, where the blood is what was written on these pages what this notepad was used for because it was used for many things it looks like it started out as kind of a cookbook it was a budget book at first and it kind of ends as a cookbook uh, David has his writings in the middle of it some b-roll footage stuff for gray state projects some interesting stuff stuff that I didn't really uh, feel necessary to put in the in the book so I'm hoping once we go through this Sunday if there's anything that I missed or anything that should be in the book then I'll try to I'll try to add it in there if I can um, the only other thing that I know that I forgot to add was David's mom I added uh, what I forgot to add about David's mom was that the fact that she died a few months later so I will be adding that into the book somehow some way somewhere the last chapter 
the gray, the, the gray shame, the last chapter, is that was a tough one. That was the one. I mean, it's it was, um, thirty-seven pages just by just by itself. It's definitely the longest chapter by far, and the most confusing one for me because it's, it, I the original idea was to have it as a timeline. I kind of backtracked on that, and then now I went back to that. So when people read that book. Uh, when they read that last chapter, the the gray shame chapter, it's probably gonna be. It might be a little difficult for people to read. Like, what the heck is going on? Like, what is this? What, what you know? You're gonna hear um, from multiple people, and there's no. Uh, it's not a cohesive story. It's a. It is a timeline of dates because the dates are the most important. Who saw David last? Who saw the family last? When, why, where, what, and how? And I think people will find that very interesting. I found it very interesting. Up until some of those last days, uh, Kamel was still texting with one of her friends, still talking about moving, still talking about um, uh, you know future future plans, working on Grace Date. She was going to write a book. All of this stuff. That sh clearly shows that David and Camille were planning for the future, not planning to end their life, all the way up until late December. And the police know this. The authorities have all this stuff. But yet, we're still supposed to just think that, um, you know, just disregard all that. Dis disregard David Crowley talking with Jason Allen and I believe uh, December 16th or so and David was wanting Jason Allen to be an executive producer on the Gray State TV series all the way up until December 16th December 17th but we're supposed to just think that sometime after that for whatever reason David Crowley snaps and kills his family Knowing what's in those documents, it's hard to buy that. I'm having a hard time buying that. And I know that I'm not the only one, too. So so thanks, everybody. I really appreciate all of your support and help. The criticism, the constructive criticism, and the ever-going struggle to find the truth and to get this family justice. God bless you all, and we'll talk soon. Hey Ellie, how's it going? Good evening. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, it's just uh, some music from um, from the YouTube, so it's their copyright-free music. That way, I don't get banned. Well, I've only been banned for music, really. <laughs> Which is weird. Whatever. Changed a little bit. Changed all this. whole year and longer <laughs> five years basically and 
click there, it should go... There you go. Nice. Thanks, Ellie. Appreciate that. Um, I won't be on too long live. Um, just for a few minutes here. weird on Twitter too it didn't it should just pop up but it didn't for some reason whatever oh that's right different time zones yeah, yeah it's only 6 42 p.m. here west coast time January 21st 2020 Best place to get the book will still be lulu.com, but it'll be on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all those good places. But you can always get it free. Download that puppy right now. Read it. Everything is source. If there's anything I missed, if there's anything I got wrong, I want to be open to that. I want people to let me know that because they're looking out for me. I do appreciate always 238 pages some of those will be blank because of the way that it goes into the printed format so don't be surprised if there's a lot of extra blank pages that's done on purpose it's okay it's for the print version It's cool. I mean, if yeah, proofread it for sure. <laughs> It'll need it. All right. I uh, just want to take a couple minutes here. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. And we are live right now. And um, I finished the book, published it on January twentieth, twenty twenty and uh, put the link out there for everybody this morning January 21st 2020 so there is a free link and let's just kind of go through that at some uh, things some issues with my website I guess or web page whatever you call this so if you go to the graystage.wordpress.com this should take you to the website I need to get rid of this little picture here I don't like that because when you click on it it just goes nowhere it goes to the same thing so I don't know how that got in there but I'll be taking that out there's a quick link directly right here I think that will take you to the book and then this one just takes you back and then this is a blog feed so I don't I haven't used WordPress that much I didn't get too far with it it's kind of clunky but it's free it's it's easy and so what I've did what I've done here is you know you just go to the web page and you can just click on read the book. This should take you directly to the URL where you can find everything you need to know about this book. You can purchase it or you can download it for free. These ads are WordPress, that's so not me. So all you need to do is just scroll down here and if you click on this image of the front the spine and the back of the book that should take you directly to where you need to go and you can download that directly shouldn't be any issue there it is there's a download it's a little different on firefox but that's okay 238 pages front and back is why you will see the um, because it was this was for for print um, front and back so you'll see some blank pages like the first four pages are blank because they need that and there's pages at the end that have to be blank that's for lulu.com that's for so that everything turns out right so there it is and 
So if you're wondering why there's so many blank pages, that would be why. I want to say hi to Sophia and to Ellie and to Nova Coco. Thank you all for chiming in here. Um, you've started reading it. Nova Coco started reading it too. Yeah, I'm curious to hear what everybody thinks about the book. Um, what they like, what, what you didn't like, you know, what I could have done better. Um, things that were left out, you know, if you thought that I missed some something or maybe even if there was stuff that didn't really need to be in there to tell this story. This story is just supposed to be focused on the public files that we got, the public um, crime scene photos, and then the the quotes that various people have also made about this case too. So... scroll down here got the table of contents got to have a nice table of contents in there let's see Sophia says oh nice how nice um, I wish Sophia says I wish this would have come out at Christmas it would have made a great gift yeah that was the original plan really was to come out on Christmas Day and um, you know that was the day that that's the, the date that is on Kamel's headstone in Texas the date of, of her death is listed is on that headstone as December 25th which I thought was kind of weird because um, nobody really really knows so that was that was a weird date to put on there um, then I wanted it to be January 17th to mark the five years and that didn't work out but I think this worked out perfectly so January 20th and then um, January 21st. So I just wanted to come on here briefly just to let everybody kind of know where they could get this book if you did want to read it, if you did want to purchase it. I'm gonna, just going to show you all that now. Uh, yes, do an honest book review. Um, it's very important. You know, it's it. I, I'm just I'm just one person. This is just me looking at these documents looking at all this stuff conversing with so many so many researchers talking with so many people on these conference calls you know books and books of just notes and notes and um, endless talks with some of the best uh, researchers that I've ever had the experience with you know whether things ended on good terms bad terms in different whether you know they had they had other issues they had other problems that they had to go and they had to take care of um you know health health problems you know i want to make sure we all pray for pray for walter for walter because he is um yeah he's you know he really needs some prayer um he was going to join us um friday and he just could not join us he wasn't able to so Please pray for his health and just to keep him in good good spirits. And who knows, I would love to get him back on one of these days here too. Because he was always somebody that I could always bounce ideas off of. And, you know, always someone that I could um, uh, just kind of say, well, what, do you, what do you think about this? You know, and, and it's good to have those, those people. And he was one of the first that I ever had. Um, we're talking about September 11th. The Bohemian Grove, the New World Order, John F. Kennedy, all of that stuff. And um, so when the David Crowley case came up, you know, I kind of bounced some ideas off of him, but it really wasn't until we did the live show um, where it was just he and, and I, and we were just talking about, I forget what episode of Heart Talk that was, but, you know, and I and he starts asking me questions, and that's what... what it really is and that's what really has helped me grow what has helped me get to this point is you know he's like well okay what 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 about this you know what about the government hit what about and, and we would just play out all of these different things and um it's really it's really nice to have people like that it's really good to have people who you can bounce those ideas off of and yeah, I'm just I'm just blessed to have so many people that I've been able to do that with. Um, Dan Hennen too, you know he was another one before this before this case. 
and we would talk about we were talking about other cases mostly about the philip marshall case which is very similar to the david crowley case in many ways um so and then of course i always blame dan hennon for even getting me involved in this case but i think it you know it wasn't it wasn't really anything that Dan could have really said that would have made me go, hmm, you know, oh, okay, there's something weird here. It was just like, I, you really, I really had to look at it for myself. I had to look at this and um, try to research, find as many documents as much as I as I could. And I do wonder, you know, if we if we wouldn't have gotten all of of the documents, all of the crime scene photos that we have now, I wonder how that would have changed my view on this case. And I probably would have leaned more towards the fact, or not the fact, but I probably would have leaned more towards the theory that David Crowley was guilty. I would have been a lot more open to that possibility. It's only because we were able to get these documents it's only because we were able to get these crime scene photos it's only because we were able to talk to people uh, who were tied into this case in different ways and that took a long time it took effort it took me a very very long time anybody who knows me knows that I move very very slow if I move at all <laughs> and that's what I did here I move slowly. Um, I wrote uh, something called A Gray Shame, maybe 15 pages, maybe. And that's where it all started for me. You know, that's when I started uh, getting calls and having weird things happen and getting, being, I was reached out to by people who should not even be reaching out to me. And um, it, it, that's when everything kind of became weird it was like okay now you're trying to you know you're not just posting things now you're trying to actually uh, look into this case and I think that's when the weird things started happening and I know a lot of you have also had that happen too you know it's uh it's when you get serious about asking questions wanting to know what happened in this case that's when a lot of the weird things happen. A lot of the weird games and all that stuff happens. And, you know, that just kind of pushes us forward. That makes us want to keep researching and to keep looking into this case to find out what happened. So, that's what I did. I asked Dan Hennon to write the foreword to my book. And he did. I think it's about four pages uh, I hope the font is okay because I really wanted it to be in this particular font here. Um, that was very important to me. And it was very nice of him to take the time to write that. And, um, you know, we, we've looked at a lot. We've gone through a lot. And I, you know, I plan on doing a lot more research with Dan Hannon and with a lot of these other fellow researchers that I've come to have a great deal of respect for and every day meeting more people you know hearing more people's views on this that helps me that helps me grow as a as a researcher that's all that I want that's all that I could do and sorry if I sound a little tired I'm very tired very groggy and very um very juiced about this and at, at the same time it's like a it's like a bittersweet thing because because of how serious this case is and because of what happened how brutal this is what happened to these people in this case and how clear it seems that there is um you know it, even if you didn't want to say that there was foul play involved in this and even if you really wanted to keep an an open mind and say okay you know david's guilty let me let me go find out where where that proof is which that in and of itself is not keeping an open mind obviously because that's uh jumping to conclusions and so 
the best researchers have been able to kind of you know just keep at it keep chipping away and keep asking questions you know the, the more data that people have the more data that we can give them I, I just think the more people are going to see what most of us here are seeing publicly and what I think that uh, family members and even friends they understand this privately whether they will go public with it or not so this is not um, you know this is not my view of what happened that's not what this book is it was never meant to be like that it was never going to be like that anybody who's read anything that I've ever done shouldn't know that you know it was very clear how I was going to write this what I was going to do this was never going to be a case of um, writing something to make money off of it it was never going to be a case of tricking people and then one day turning and you know saying that I always knew that David Crowley was was guilty or something like that which has happened you know I've had people question me uh, about that and there's nothing wrong with that you know there's nothing wrong with asking me about that I don't have any problem with that but um, I can only be honest with you I can only tell you that you know we're real researchers looking into this and I I hope that this book will help other researchers kind of get caught up on this um, so I'm just kind of scrolling a little bit through here through some of the forward from Dan Hitt. yeah it's about four pages I thought it was good now there was things um, that I did take out and I don't know maybe in a future show I'm thinking maybe we'll kind of maybe we can just those might make good sub subtopics that we can bring up later on that's what I'm hoping so uh, let's see okay Ellie says, at this point, I think it's fair to say that they were slaughtered. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I think that's that's where it, it comes into play, where it's like you look at all of the blood, all, all the stuff that is in the house. I know there's not blood where it should be, but I'm talking about where the blood is and on that wall. You know, there shouldn't be any blood on that wall. That Why would anybody ever write? anybody else's name in blood on that wall and why is that just kind of glossed over but so yeah they were slaughtered if you look at the at those bodies look at what happened to those bodies they were slaughtered the only way that they can say that they weren't is to say that it was after their death which is it that's also weird too there's something very weird about them just kind of jumping jumping the gun on that um, Nova Coco says, "Hey Greg, do you know if they will ship the book to New Zealand and how much for it in NZ dollars?" You know, I'm not sure about that. Um, I know we can go and take a look over there. It might be different because uh, it will be on Amazon and Barnes and Noble probably in like another week. I think it takes takes a little time there, but. I don't know if let's see if you guys have New Zealand I don't know if they have um, so if you go to lulu.com I guess that pro would probably be the best way if you can get there then you would you would know that um, that you could make that purchase so I'm not really sure but I do know with your Amazon yes you can do that so if you want to wait um, may wait maybe another week or or two or else I would say, you know, just just go here and see how far you you can get. They should be able to um they should be able to send it to you. Maybe there's somewhere that I can check on that actually here while I'm here to see. But I do believe they are in Europe. So I do believe they are in the UK, New Zealand, Australia. I could be wrong, but yeah, I think they should too. So can definitely check that one out. Um, see if there's anything else. I think that really was about it. I just wanted to kind of jump on here and let everybody know where they can go, where they can get the 
the book if you want to get that in a, in a free download and I also put it right here I need to move this up actually this the gray stage book should be one up but you can also just go you can just go to the gray stage dot wordpress dot com scroll down to the bottom and where all of the documents are I've also added the book link there so you can just now that's for the for the free version um, you can just download that free PDF right there to get the paid version you want to go to lulu.com put in Greg Fernandez jr or you can just go to my website thegraystage.wordpress.com and just click on where it says the gray stage book and from right there you'll scroll down I'll be adjusting some of this there's way too much going on here but um, and you go to available.now boom that'll take you to the lulu.com link or you can just go and purchase a physical copy here that'll take you to the same place and then very soon once the um, once it's on Barnes and Noble and all of the other online places I'll have those links up there too so try to make it as easy for anybody who, who wants to for the for the sign copy that's what I'm working on now and I was gonna kinda ask what everybody um, thought about that uh, with the sign copy yeah I gotta I gotta figure out the best way maybe I'll set up um, I mean I don't know I don't know if I just say hey send me fifteen dollars to my to my PayPal and then I'll you know with your shipping address where to where to ship it and then I'll ship it back signed I think that might be the easiest way I don't know I'm trying to think of the easiest fastest way to actually do that so that might be the easiest way and then I'll just order it and have it sent out there I don't know I'll I'll figure all that out but um, I'm gonna go let my cat in one second here you're okay <laughs> okay all right I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up here I just wanted to kind of make it clear where everybody could get that if they wanted to and um, oh I did add let me go back is this still the main page here no it's not the main page I did add finally the phone records so David's old phone number, Camille's old phone number, David's new phone number, and Camille's a new phone number. I have added those four in there. I also added the military record, David's military record. So if anybody wants to see that, I don't know if there's anything that I missed. I always feel like, oh, I should have added this. I should have added that. Maybe there's a few other documents that I missed, and there might be. So um, I'll have to go back and see if there's any ones that I missed. But hopefully I've added everything here all of the public documents that we have so far hey patty how's it going thanks for joining in oh the kitty yeah i can have her sign it i'm sure she would she's she's been a big part of this too huh been a big part of this <laughs> and i'll have to get rid of some of this stuff here and I don't know I might even um, uh, I might even break it up into different chapters and have those different chapters there too but the goal the next thing that I really want to do hopefully they don't play any music because apparently I'll get banned if anybody plays any music but this will be the next step this will be where the book gets turned into an audiobook and I'm looking forward to that process yeah I think that'll be that'll be the final step there I think blue poster paint like so <laughs> yeah okay buddy yeah, we can do that definitely not red yeah no red no red paint only the good paint And that's it. I don't know. Hopefully, I didn't miss any documents. If I did, please let me know. Uh, there's the there's the cell phone. 
with the missing SIM card. And there's just so much that was not included into this book, and some of it was really hard to part with. It was hard to not include that in there, but it wasn't necessary. And I and Ellie's right. The more information, the better. So that's why this, the other information, um, you know, I'm not. We're not just gonna sleep on it. We're gonna do some. We're gonna do something with it. So we'll see. Um, Sophia. Oh, Sophia, regarding the footprints the footprint video that she made I was trying to be considerate to the family that's why I chose blue M that makes sense um Sophie I don't know if you heard we had somebody on who was um they left a comment and they said that maybe to use a more oil-based paint next time I think it was I'll have to go back and look at that comment but um to get to get closer to blood to get closer to what it would look like in blood so and it might even be good you know if you're going to do some more of those tests it might even be good to do some with a little bit of the blood you know a little bit of the paint a lot of the paint because um, it does kind of look like there's not that much on david's feet it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of paint there a whole lot of blood there or um Go back here. See where is that one? Just for fun. So I did. I did thin the paint with water. Yeah, I remember you. You commented on that. I decided against oils only because of cleanup. Okay. I mean, it. It was always the first thing that we thought I think was it was tippy toes because it was just very little there was none on the heel or anything it was just on just in that certain area so I think that's why it was a tippy toe but I don't think we got this photo first I think the first one we got the first one that I remember seeing had one of these prints here and it looked like a hand. I mean, it, it, there was no doubt. And I think that's what this other area is kind of here. It might be a, a handprint. I don't know. Um, when they sprayed it. And that's that was the first thing. But, okay, so all of this, I think you guys called it cast off blood. You know, a lot of that stuff. Um, there's, just, there's just so much so much that could be covered um so much that for whatever reason was left out you know a lot of the things like that because it was really just i mean the book was really just to make sure that it just focused on the actual documents so that when we have these these talks when we're talking about you know are these footprints or are these fingerprints or hey i i think they're footprints you think they're fingerprints that's fine you know that's that's okay there's nothing wrong with that um, and I, I think there's still a lot of people who are just reading the the actual documents I think there's a lot of people who are just still trying to get caught up on what is in the uh, 94 pages because there is a, a lot of stuff in there a lot and a anyone who's looked at those 94 pages already already knows that <laughs> there's way too much in there way too much data so th i mean the hardest chapter for me was probably the last one that was really and that was weird because i was expecting this to be the the easiest one the the gray stage chapter should have been the easiest chapter for me to to write because it's pretty much an an expanded version of the very first thing that i ever wrote in regards to this case and it's clunky you know it's cumbersome it's very convoluted i guess it just everything just seems kind of jumbled and kind of just but the point what i was trying to do with this chapter was to make it like a like a timeline that needed to be this needed to be told um in order because this is how i remember this story in this order here 
you know, looking at everything. And instead of having, you know, okay, we know David, okay, then we're going to go back. It needed to be as much of a timeline as a linear timeline as possible because I know that that is what's going to help people get caught up. It's what's going to be good for for people like me who forget things to go back and check these sources, to check these data, to check these facts. I'm hoping it's going to save us a lot of time, a lot of people, a lot of time. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. You know, I have no problem going over these things as much as possible. But the purpose here was to kind of give a linear storyline kind of of what we knew, what I knew, based on the facts, based on these documents, based on what they've said, what they've done, who said what, but mostly just based on the Apple Valley documents and the BCA documents. That's all that you really need here. That, to me, is more than enough for people to realize that this case, at the very least, needs to be reopened to give the investigators a chance to clear their name. If they don't want to clear David's name at this point, they've got to clear their own name because this just stinks. You know, this just does not constitute a double murder suicide. It, it, it just really doesn't. So, let's see. No four, <laughs> no four hour chat. No, I was, I was supposed to already be done here. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, 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 uh. Fairly certain. Yeah, Sophia is fairly certain that it is a hand. Yeah, I just, I mean, I could see maybe some of that being a hand. I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's all hand prints. I don't think anybody's walking on their hands here. I do believe these are footprints. I definitely believe this is a footprint. I definitely believe this is a footprint. But, you know, that doesn't make me right, you know, and that doesn't, that doesn't make me scared to be wrong either. Because it's not gonna, it's not gonna do me any good to, to just think that I'm right. Um, that's not gonna help, you know. If I, if I end there, I can start there, because I'm definitely starting there, because I do think that I'm right. I do think that these are footprints here, and I do think that the investigators, they have all separately documented those as footprints. But at the same time, I, you know, I'm not closing the, the door on the possibility that they are handprints, um, mostly because of the one photo that shows um, what looks like a handprint in that same area, which is not with not those two footprints. There's something else there to the to the right of one of those footprints. So, anyways. Uh, uh. Yeah, a lot of things were never tested. Patty says, uh, I do think she was hit over the head a few times, cast off in hair and brain matter on chair. She might have been in a fight or flight and reached the floor. I don't know. Yeah, it's not a bad thought there. And Sophia says, oh, the, uh, no, the cast off was never tested. Okay, yeah, it wasn't tested. Um, well, the footprints were really never either <laughs> so whatever oh boy just another thing i'm trying to get to that photo where they paint uh, they paint them blue pretty much so blue is definitely the right i think blue is the right color for that because of that reason here let's see okay so those are the ones but i want to get to where they're painted where they're sprayed should be at the bottom here. Here we go. So BCA five zero one three. You know, to me, this looks like a footprint here. To me, when I look at it there. It does. This looks like the Greek foot, David's foot. So I don't know. I mean, they did all those tests. Where's the results on all of this stuff that they did here? I, I'd like to see that. Maybe we just don't have it, but. I mean, this one here kind of looks like a fingerprint, so I don't know. You know, it looks like a whole hand went went down. But again, I don't think somebody's walking around on their hands 
and not using their feet. But that's all right. I'll just zoom in on this one here as well. So there's the D, there's the E. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know. You know, it kind of looks like a like a foot, but then when they spray it, it kind of looks more like a like a hand. And, um, and that could be more. I mean, looking at it here, it looks looks like a, this looks like a foot, and then this one over here looks like a foot. I don't know what the heck this is over here. That looks like something else. But um, then there were questions about it being smeared, and. Um, or about maybe it was wiped up and when they sprayed the chemical on it they were able to trace what was actually wiped up so in the, all that stuff is good to talk about it's good to um, discuss with fellow researchers if they're open to it but um, it's it's I don't know. It just to me, it was not one. Of, it's, it was not one of the things that made it into the to the book. Another thing that I it was very important that didn't make it into the book. I don't know. I don't. It might have. I might have snuck it in there at some point. I don't think so though. Was the headphones and how the headphones didn't have any blood on them, but the phone did, <laughs> and where these things were found. Uh, yeah, it, it looks like and empty your pocket deal now look at this yellow marker here since we're here I'm gonna go through this yellow marker okay keep an eye on that yellow marker there because when you look at the glass table where the um, where the teapot is and where the ring is placed later on and photographed one of those yellow markers is there, and I can never really figure out what that one was. Come on. Uh, let me see if it's in this set of photos or if it's in the Apple Valley ones. But it's where you can clearly see there's that yellow marker and there's like a yellow piece of paper or something next to it. And it's just, it's just the weirdest thing. It's one of the oddest photos that I still kind of... And like what the heck is that so let me see if I can go if I can find it I will do my best to look for it before I know it's here and then I will have to jump off very soon but I just want people to look at this and I'd like to get some views on this one it looks like a piece of like yellow construction paper. It's just it's just odd. Of course now I'm not gonna be able to find it, I'm sure. Uh, it might be in the might be in the Apple Valley crime scene photos. <clears throat> okay, let's go. This was the first one, DSC0238. So this was the first image that I ever saw of this. And it's like, if you look at where the E is next to the 14, you know, that was like, okay, that looks like a hand to me. The others, I think, look like um, feet. Um, it, this one definitely, I was, I, this one even, I was kind of wondering, was is that a, a, a dog paw? But look at all of this. Look at how all of this other stuff here. Does that show that something was actually wiped up? That's been a big question there. Okay, I'm going to find... Oh, maybe it's this one here. Yes, it is. Very quickly, very quickly. So I'm so burnt out. I'm going to crash pretty soon here. Okay, this yellow marker... 
Okay, what is the yellow marker for? The other one was for the cell phone. So, you know, there's orange markers and there's yellow markers, by the way. So, there you go. I don't know. What is this little piece of construction? I don't know, construction paper or something. But it's next to the weird photo of the of a pyramid, which looks like a black and white snake or something next to it. I don't know about that either. You can clearly see in here the ring is not there. So, I don't know if the ring was already taken off or if it hadn't made its way onto this table yet. But what is this yellow marker here? So, I'll leave you guys with that one for now. Um... Yeah, and that should do it. So again, just you know, everybody knows where to go, where 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 to get this book. If you have a a website and if you want to, you know, host this, you want to download it, put it onto your own website, you're more than welcome to. Um, I just I want to get this into the hands of as many researchers as possible. That is the goal. And the goal is not was not to get my view into the hands of as many people as possible. It's to get the documents, to get the information in these documents. So that um, is very important to me. That was one of the main things. I wanted to keep my personal views out of it as much as possible, as much as I could. You know, I I do have my own views on on things, but I definitely wanted to stick to these documents as much as possible and just kind of be like a um like a like a quick sheet for the thousands <laughs> the, for the thousands of pages that we have or hundreds of pages that we have of documents a quick reference when people say oh well that sounds weird then they can go and they can look it up source number this source number that i think 10 pages of, of sources maybe even even more that just gives you where those sources are so and based on that you know based on that I think people will be able to understand that um, there's just there's just nothing here to prove David Crowley guilty all right uh, Ellie says like you said a trail of breadcrumbs yeah it could be I mean they just leave us little little crumbs here and so um, you know Let's find the meat in the breadcrumbs. How about that? Oh, it says, wise man knows he knows nothing at all, but I do know they were not killed there on that rug 100%. Yeah, I have a lot of people that say that and that think that. And when I listen to why they say that and why they think that, you know, it's, um, that's, that helps me get a different view. It helps me get a different picture, and um, and it, and it helps me see maybe things that I'm not seeing here. So, I mean, I I I'm open I'm open to a lot of different things happening here. There are some things that I'm not open to <laughs> that I just am like no not even going to go down that rabbit hole because it's not a rabbit hole it's just a trail of crap but um you know a trail of crap to somebody else might be a rabbit hole to another person you just never know but whatever road whatever you want to look at wherever you want to go i hope that this book helps answer some of those basic facts it helps answer some of the basic questions um given you some of the basic facts that we have that the public has so when people try to tell you that these are are not facts, um, I mean, you can just say, well, this is what the document says. This is what these people say. You know, there's no, there's nothing in here in these thousand pages that show that David Crowley is guilty. And if there aren't any pages that show that he's guilty, then. You know, I think that's a good place to start. It's a good way to start. And for me, it's a good way to go back, to go forward, which I do many times in these cases. So, all right, everyone. Thanks again. Um, really appreciate you all joining me here and hope to be back. Probably won't be back this week with a live show, but hopefully next week. And um, I don't know if you have any topics that you think that we might cover. Let me know and we will make sure to cover those hopefully next week. 
I think one of, I think I'll grab some of the stuff that I did not put in the book and I and we'll make that at least um, part of what we talk about if we can get Christian back on um, I want to hear you know we I want to hear from him about uh, what our next step is for the the documentary for the real the real documentary all right everybody have a great night um, if you have any thoughts about this image DSC 0254 please let me know I, I'm trying to figure out what this yellow marker is <laughs> forever apparently all right good peeps God bless you all have a great testing one two testing one two and three like we are live. We are indeed. Okay, she was checking to make sure going to be going over some of the extras, some of the extra things that were not put into the book, The Gray Stage. There's um, it's about 23 pages here. I don't know how much we'll get to, but we'll get to as much of it as we can in the next hour. I want to thank everybody joining in the chat room right now. I know it's a little early. Today is February 5th, 2020. So far, it's been a good year, and I hope it stays that way. So let's go through this. We'll start at page 1 of 23 here. These are just kind of random things that either got taken out or just didn't make sense or it was just it felt too choppy to keep in. But So I figure we'll just go through these here. All right, investigators spent close to a year looking for evidence to support their allegations against a Minnesota filmmaker and combat veteran. What began as suspicious deaths evolved into a Minnesota murder mystery. Was David the protagonist or the antagonist? And that's always been, that's, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn this up here. Hopefully the volume doesn't change too much, but. And that's always been a big thing is um, we were always told that David was the bad guy in this story, but eh, I think a lot of people are not so sure. You know, I want to say hi to everybody joining us in the chat as well. Appreciate that. Sometimes we catch people from other countries because it's uh, we usually do these shows at night and obviously it's the morning time here in the Bay Area. San Francisco. All right. This was a person that was not thinking clearly, Apple Valley Police Captain John Reichgold told Fox 9 investigator Tom Lydon. David's mind at that point was deranged. He just was not in a normal state. He wasn't thinking rationally. That's an interesting question or an interesting statement, I should say, because then it goes back to, okay, what made them think this? Where did this theory that David wasn't thinking rationally, that he was quote-unquote deranged. Where is this theory coming from? Looking through the 94 pages, looking through the 800, almost 900 pages of BCA data, uh, I don't see anything in there that would make me think that David was deranged or that he wasn't thinking rationally. And I mean that because based on what the investigators say, their own documents, their own words, their own notes, where is this part about him being deranged or not thinking rationally and not in a normal state? Hey, good morning to Michaela. Thanks for joining me. 
just if you want to follow along if you have any questions comments or concerns i'll try to address those as i go hey sophia long time no chat i'm gonna see how much of this i can cover in about an hour here um, so I've been looking into the allegations against David Crowley for close to five years now. When I began looking into this case, my goal was to find evidence of David's guilt. Five years later, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Just like the U2 song. <laughs> Good morning, Jennifer Watkins. Appreciate you joining, listening in here, and reading along if you want. All right, is David guilty because he lived in the house where the crime happened? Owned the gun, allegedly fired into the living room? I mean, that's basically it. It's because he was there, because it was his house. I mean, that's the basis of their whole theory. Because it's definitely not anything based on the evidence found there. So, just because an official theory is created does not mean justice has been served. And that's another big point, too. <coughs> You know, justice doesn't come by us just closing our closing our eyes, closing our mouths, turning the other way. That's not justice. So anyone that thinks that there has been justice for David Crowley, for his wife, for his daughter, and for their family, you are you are just fooling yourself because it has not happened yet. Not yet. You don't get justice by assuming David is guilty of such a, hor a horrific crime. Very true. Local law enforcement did not solve this case. That's very important, too. They have not solved this case. The case, the status of exceptionally cleared may be a suitable conclusion for some, but that does not mean the case is solved. Investigators have a duty to solve cases whenever possible. If the case cannot be solved, then investigators should make that clear as well. The misinformation and disinformation associated with the allegations against David Crowley are very disturbing. And I know a lot of you already know that as well. Sophia says, no proof to back, that, to back up that official theory. Yeah, even though we were told that they had proof, proof is coming, everybody's seen it, but nobody, <laughs> nobody can um, produce any of it. Oh, just grabbing my coffee here as well. I'm not a morning person, not an early bird, but I've been wanting to do this for a while and I just have not had the time. Okay, the placement of the alleged murder weapon, item one, is described below. So this is where it was found, um, northeast and always wanted somebody to kind of help us take this and show us exactly where on that map that we have on the map that shows um, where the bodies were I want to see exactly where this lines up it's a very accurate number it's too bad they couldn't look up and see where a bullet hole was but I guess that wasn't really important unfortunately that's item one the pistol these are notes from the day that the bodies were found, 1-17-2015. Um, for the BCA, I'm assuming this is their case number, S15.00662. So I wanted to put that in the book. I probably should have, but um, I don't know. For whatever reason, I decided to keep it out. And that's from the BCA 488, page 122. Very important I try to source everything. Um, it just makes it a lot easier for researchers to just jump to the back of the book and go and find it. Don't hold your breath, Sophia says. I'm assuming you're saying that for the um, for <laughs> the official theory to be true. <laughs> a blood-like substance was swabbed from the frame, breech face, and firing pin of the alleged murder weapon, item one. I do believe I did end up putting that part in there. But that's an interesting. So, uh, from the frame, right, these are all outside things. Firing pin. 
I just found that interesting. I, I just feel like somebody is going to read that and understand that a lot better with a lot of this stuff in this book, you know. Um, all I did was just take the facts, take the stuff that was in the book, and just basically documented them without trying to give as much of my thoughts and opinions on them for proof, yeah. Yeah, if they if there was any proof that David Crowley was guilty, it definitely would have reached the investigators. If anybody is holding proof from the investigators, that's a whole nother issue. But I don't I don't see that being the case either. But regardless, the investigators have made it clear that the case is exceptionally cleared. That does not necessarily prove David guilty. It just doesn't. While in the military, David Crowley served in a designated imminent danger pay area. David was obligated to be called up to the United States Army Reserve until June 23, 2011. So that's really June 23, 2011 is really the day that he was, you know, done, completely done. I'm assuming. Didn't have to worry about ever being called back. Nothing. Medical records for David Kamel and Rania were found somewhere inside the house. This, that's from BCA 485, page 374. Now, the, I wanted, I wrote that down, or, and that made it into almost to the final draft, but um, the medical records that were found in the house I think also show that you know there was nothing in the medical records that stuck out to them they don't meant the the investigators uh, don't mention anything that would make David or Kamel or his wife or his daughter or any of them crazy based on their medical records I think if they would have had something in there uh, again they would have used that to prove their theory the fact that they didn't, they had a lot of things, uh, they had everything, and they did not use that to prove their theory because it did not prove their theory. Four prescription bottles with pills inside of each of them were found in a kitchen drawer and photographed on the kitchen counter. That's another big point there. Uh, I guess I didn't, oh, there's the image there. Uh, so this is image BCA 5157, and you can see them in the right-hand corner here. And that's another big one because I would love to find out what these prescriptions are. One of these you can almost see. I can almost see on this laptop here, so hopefully somebody can help us with that. I think one was ibuprofen or something like that, but I don't remember what the other ones were. But you can see there's... There's pills in all of these, all four of these. And I think if anything, if these pills would have made David crazy or something like that, I think they would have mentioned that as well. Just a little side note on this image here. This is um, along the kitchen wall, the back kitchen wall. Um, and you can see the milk bones over there as well. More dog food. More food for the dog to get to, but didn't. All right. You can also see the checkbook that is in there as well. Used. I believe it's only in David's name. I don't know if there is one in Kamel's name. I haven't seen one. The coffee, that was a big issue too. I'm still, still um, interested in how old the coffee was on the kitchen counter. Uh, let's see. Okay, then I have a list here, just a snapshot. This is from the BCA notes, BCA 488, and this just shows the BCA agents that were at the crime scene. So I ended up taking that out too as well. Uh, Sophia says, ibuprofen showed up in Kamel's to toxicology screen, but not pot. Yeah, and, and there's four of them there, so question is how many were hers how many were david's how many were possibly ranya's how many were for the dog um 
and if that's the only thing that is found in anybody's system, if ibuprofen is the only thing found in anybody's system, then again, it's like they're, the medical records don't really matter and those pills don't really matter. The pot doesn't even matter because they didn't find it in their system, just, just like you said. So none of that matters. All right, DSC-0227. DSC-0227 is an image taken in David's office bedroom. The note page with words, Where there are lies, there are liars, and dear any American. Most likely came from the notepad labeled as item 41. GS-2015 schedule was written on the notebook underneath. An interesting note about Danny Mason's character being hunted is visible with the words Wank Hunted. John Wank is the character Danny Mason played in the 2012 Gray State concept trailer. Except Bitcoin was written on a yellow sticky note, though it isn't clear though it isn't clear where the cryptocurrency would be accepted or what it would be accepted for. Underneath the notepad underneath the notebook was a piece of paper Underneath the notebook was a piece of a paper towel with a stuffed animal tag on it. The tag was for a Cuddlekins ring tailored lemur. The tag probably belonged to the white colored stuffed animal remains found in the living room floor. Another notebook with items crossed off was underneath the paper towel and on top of the black SanDisk memory card. A court-ordered class action notice rested beneath the stack of papers and the memory card. Here's the image, and then I want to go back to go back through those points. DSC 0227. Just a lot here on the surface. Uh, it might not seem like that much. Maybe it's not. Maybe there isn't really that much to it. But it's a very. In there's a lot going on here. A lot going on here. Um, Sophia says regarding the pills, how many were even valid and being used? Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. I don't know. It could have been old pills in the box. Okay, so let's go through this again one by one. Um, the note page with the words "Where there are lies, there are liars," and "Dear any American," most likely came from the notepad labeled as item forty-one. So this top one here, this is this could be it. This is ripped out, right? That notepad um, found in the office bedroom where David allegedly wrote, "Open the rise, most recent version, submit to Allah now." In that note, that's where this paper most likely came from. This piece of notepad. So it was a question of when was this here? Because it's out. It's the most recent one. It's on top of everything else. Kind of st sticks out. So, and if you look at the writing here, does this writing match the writing on the notepad? And does it match? Does it match the pen? Because the pin on the, the pin next to item 41, the, the notepad, looks like a ballpoint pen. This is like, this is felt, so this is different. Different type of pen used here. Same notepad. When was it put out there? And I guess it just became too much of, uh, you know, it's a, to keep a nice, clear, concise story um, that didn't have a lot of speculation. You know, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here is speculation. Um, it's just, and it's it's all stuff that it doesn't really further the investigation, I guess. At least the, the first investigation for new researchers, which is who this book is for. It's really for people that are just getting started. All of this stuff might be great for later on. Not necessary to get somebody involved into this case in the book i try to use as a pitch to get people involved into this case so I didn't want to put in too much of the confusing things or some things that we could do right now and probably spend hours talking about just this one image here <laughs> that's not good for the for the book i want to say hi to nova nova coco thanks for joining it's 5 a.m. over here. It's 5 a.m. What's the date over there, Nova? Right here it is 8.04 a.m. on February 5th, and today is a Wednesday. 
All right, next one. Uh, GS 2015 schedule was written on the notebook underneath. So you can see that right here, GS 2015 schedule. And of course, that's a interesting thing because it again shows more proof that David was planning for his future. In retro retrospect, I wonder I wonder if I should have kept that in there as well. But because there is a lot of things, we could probably do a whole show that just talk about um, all the different evidence that shows David Crowley was planning for his future, actively planning for his future. You got the intersecting holidays, Christmas, and New Year's. So even though they've made a big deal that David was um, not going to his family's gatherings for Thanksgiving or Christmas or even New Year's, um, this shows that he had plans for 2015, plans for Gray State 2015. All that comes crashing down. All that comes to a halt, as we know. All right, so those are just two of the things there. I mean, I, I think I looked at this photo way too much, and <laughs> it just got to the point where, am I reading too much into this? Um, an interesting note about Danny Mason's character being hunted is, vis is visible with the words wank hunted, and the name just, <laughs> it just drives me crazy. I'm sorry. shouldn't be like that, <laughs> but it does. So where is that? Where is this wank? Oh, here it is, right down here next to the Bitcoin. It's very, very small, but you can see it wank hunted. So I just thought that that was an interesting note there, too. The in, um, And that's, you know, also part of the 2015 thing. So his character uh, looks like, depending on when this was written on this notepad, Danny Mason's character was still going to be a big, it, it was going to be heavily involved in this script, in this um, project going forward. So, just as an actor, just as an actor, that's it. Now here's one. Except Bitcoin was written on a yellow sticky notepad, though it isn't clear where the cryptocurrency would be accepted or what it would be accepted for. I mean, it's just a lot of, I'm like, uh, I'm thinking way too deeply into it. Except Bitcoin. It's just on a notepad. It's just like a note, a mental note, but on paper. Staying away from the digital world, apparently. I don't know. But it was like, okay, accept Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin cryptocurrency was a big thing back then. It was still new, but it was a really big deal. Um, and it's, I don't know, from what I hear now, it's kind of fading out. and um, Yeah, slowing, slowing down, I guess. But I don't know. I'm not really into the Bitcoin thing or the cryptocurrency, but it's interesting because I know a lot of the people that he was surrounding himself with were, and um, that was supposed to be the next wave of the future. When you talk about Bitcoin, um, it's almost like we're talking about a digital currency, and then it gets into the mark of the beast, and I could go on and on and on for that. So I'm glad I held back a little bit there, at least on that section. But... I was always curious if David owned Bitcoin, and I know, I remember we talked about this a long time ago, so if anybody re remembers, if anything was ever found, did David own any Bitcoin, any cryptocurrency, because um, that could be a motive too, um, That's there's a lot, there's a lot there. So that would be interesting. Uh, obviously, if he is accepting Bitcoin, what is he accepting it for? Who is going to be donating to this Bitcoin thing? I, you know, it just it gets into that whole thing. So I think at some point I was just like, all right, I'm just getting rid of that. Um, we'll put it in the chapter notes and nonsense. And <laughs> save it for later. Okay, what else? Okay, underneath that notebook was a piece of a paper towel with a stuffed animal tag on it. Stuffed animal tag on top. Okay. So the paper towel. Again, you'll see a lot of paper towels in this house. Paper towels are everywhere. But it's just a weird place for a paper towel to just be. And again, it doesn't have to mean anything. But it's... 
it's interesting that where the paper towel is where this stuff is all set out it's like laid out perfectly and this is in the office bedroom where this image is DSC 0227 worth looking at um, <laughs> interesting number too so that paper towel is just I don't know it's just more interesting than the paper towel is what's on top of the paper towel is that tag so let's go to the lemur tag underneath that notebook was a piece of paper towel with the stuffed animal tag on top the tag was for a cuddlekins ring tailored lemur the tag probably belonged to the white colored stuffed animal remains found in the living room floor and i i'm starting to think that there were two stuffed animals there had to have been at least two stuffed animals because there's one found there's in one of the pictures uh the lemur is found next to the uh next to the christmas tree then or what looks like the tail of that lemur maybe it's another stuffed animal then in another photo next to the um uh next to the living room sorry my cat's distracting me next to the living room couch the sectional couch where David's feet are kind of in that area where Kamel's head is kind of in that area pieces of the lemur are clearly there but then you have the tag the lemur tag in David's office not only that but you have the piece the other piece of the lemur tag if you look up north of this tag you can see right here you might not be able to see it depending on your screen I'm just gonna circle it here but it's that piece of the tag that rips off so it's fresh um, which made me think maybe it's a Christmas present maybe that's what this lemur was was one of the Christmas presents that we've been looking for aside from that teapot but it's clearly a lemur you can clearly see exactly what it is there and uh, I looked it up didn't cost that much and we even had somebody do a do a test to see what a dog ripping up a stuffed animal would actually look like another notebook with items crossed off was underneath the paper towel so you got one two three I mean you got all this notebook all this stuff just kind of here just kind of hanging out um, but what is on that other notepad? And then you have a SanDisk memory card underneath that, and underneath that, a court order class action notice underneath it. So I don't know. And then the paper, you can see, all you can really see is poster, and then pre-holding three, some three tries and up something like that but these things are crossed off so it's it's a crossed off list here but I'd love to see more of the GS 2015 schedule and what's behind that it just seems weird that you have stacks on stacks but it's kind of organized it's 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 kind of where maybe David wanted to make sure he could see all of these different things but if this is another note really if you think about it this one right here even though it's a meme that's probably why they couldn't call it a um, a suicide note or anything <laughs> but you know it's another note that is found that doesn't mean anything apparently all right so I think that's it for DSC 0227 and it's just like after going through that after reading it it's like I didn't really get anything out of that did that need to be in this book or was it better to be left out it's just there's already enough weird things already enough strange things going on so let's go down to the basement all right we have already covered item 45 found in the basement wall so let's look at some other interesting things found in the basement a circular strand of human hair was found on the second lowest step leading into the basement an unusual piece of dog feces rested on the basement floor nearby. Yeah, I mean, BCA 4630, and it's not a pretty sight. It's, it's weird. You know, I've never really seen um, poop like that, but 
would have been nice if they would have tested it or done something with it. Sorry to zoom in on the piece of poop there, but um, the question would be, is this healthy or not? Is this a healthy piece of poop? BCA4630. There you go, to go with your morning coffee. All right, according to the BCA crime scene team, Jill Cooksley, no obvious chemical smell was observed in the basement, but the smell of human decomposition was very strong. That's from BCA 488, page number 110. So we heard a lot about some of the smells, and there was you know, lack of smell. Why didn't anybody report any of the smells? But the first responders do report strong smell while they're standing by the side of the house next to the garage so there is a strong smell coming from that house even there um, but it's weird that the smell is all the way down here or is it weird let me ask you that is it weird that the smell of human decomposition was very strong in the basement While it's very clear that there's no obvious chemical smell observed in the basement, does that mean that there was an obvious chemical smell observed somewhere else in the house? You could go on and on. And it would have been nice um, to be able to ask the investigators, to be able to ask you know, the BCA crime scene team lead, Joe Cooksley, about this stuff. Maybe it's not too late. Maybe it's still not too late, but usually once they're done with all this, they just wrap up and they, they go home. They don't really want to talk about it anymore or give some statement, but um, if I could speak with anybody from the BCA, it would definitely be Joe Cooksley, just to get more about the smells. But the smell of human de decomposition, if it's that strong in the basement, um, does you know? Does that show that maybe there was some human decomp that was leaking through the living room floor? Uh, if the decomp is strong in the basement, does that also help us? I mean, should we also think that the decomp is strong throughout the whole top level of that house through the garage? How does decomp smell work? Does it rise? Does it go lower? Does it hang there? You know, it, it's, it's, these are just some of the questions that I was asking. So I included this, but uh, ended up taking it out later on. Because it just, I would just sit there and probably ponder that question, those questions for a long, long time. Just spinning in circles, I guess. Dog feces was found in multiple areas of the basement floor. Curtains were not on the curtain rod above the bathtub in the base from in the basement bathroom. Several feet of clear tubing was found in the tub near the rubber drain stopper. I think for uh, Rania's bathroom too, there weren't any curtains on there as well. But the lack of curtains on the basement, um, maybe I should pull that up too. Kind of what I didn't want to do. I just wanted to read through that, but got a little time. Let's go down here. Must be probably in the BCA. I'm only going to do that with this image. So, yeah, in the in the bedroom. BCA 4497, curtain rod is not on in Rania's bedroom, I'm sorry, in Rania's bathroom. There's no curtain rod there. There is a curtain rod in the master bedroom. And I know this, this stuff might not mean anything to anyone, but that's okay. You know, I have no problem talking about it. Because I don't know. That's the only way that I'm going to figure out if it means anything to me. So here is BCA 4674. No curtain rod there. So that was just the only thing I wanted to show. Just to kind of coincide with what I was saying here. Alright. Just going to plug in. Oh, it's plugged in. 
plug my laptop in so my battery does not die. Alright, let's keep going through this. So we got that. Several feet of clear tubing was found in the tub near the rubber drain stopper. Another interesting one that you can just spend a lot of time thinking about this here. Okay, first of all, the bathtub is dirty, really dirty. You got this tubing that's just there. <laughs> it's just hanging out there. And maybe, if, I think, for a nebulizer... And the other option was maybe for a fish tank. There was a fish tank in that basement at, at one point. I have seen a photo of that. The other thing is that there's the stopper in there as well. So um, <laughs> that was another thing that kind of stuck out is the stopper is just there. But it's dirty. You know, it's really dirty. So I don't know if this was newly in installed. How long does it take to create a new bathroom because that's what David did he basically built this bathroom in his basement and there's still work to be done you can see that here in this next image um, but if you want to go check that one out that's BCA 4676 lots of discussion on that one so I that's why it probably got this far and was just cut out because I didn't spend a lot of time in the basement and I didn't know where to actually put this one here so it just fell by the wayside. The bathroom toilet lid was open with very little water inside. The toilet seat looked clean and a clear plastic cup was found nearby. David made his own styrofoam pieces for insulin against for insulation against the bathroom wall. That's BCA 4678. So, here is that cup. There's a cup, a plastic cup in every right next to every bathroom in, in every bathroom uh in Rania's I think in Rania's bathroom there's one in the trash but in the other two there's this cup here there's just a plastic cup just I don't know just seem weird to me seem weird almost like a sign of some type um one of the theories one of the prevailing theories and one of the ones that I take very seriously is that uh the Crowleys were in a hostage situation in their own home I think that's highly possible highly possible even possibly from as early as October <laughs> Man, it sounds crazy but you just never know so uh, the styrofoam back here you can see he made his own styrofoam that's what these uh, round pieces are here as well there's a few on the side here the bucket was there was a bucket in the basement on the other side of this wall and so that's probably where it came from but it just always struck me as odd that there would just be this cup next to each toilet I don't know I don't know anybody who keeps a cup next to their toilet so that really threw me off but um, the other side of this toilet I don't know, let me see if I can pull that image up quickly. Because that looks pretty clean too. Maybe not in this one. Uh, so when the toilet seat lid is down, I think it looks pretty pretty clean. But the um the top of it you can you can see. But you know, look at the water. That was another big thing about how much water was actually in here. Where the water was, where it is now. All right, with the and here's what Joe Cooksley says, with the exception of holes or closets, Joe Cooksley noted, there was nothing of forensic significance found in the basement in Rania's bedroom or in the three bathrooms. That's BCA 488 page 108. With the exception of holes or closets, I was not aware that they found anything of forensic significance in the closets. Not closet. Closets. What did they find in the closets of forensic sig significance? That's not mentioned. But that would be interesting to know what it is in those closets. Hmm. You 
can look that one up, BCA 488, page 108. Mr. Cooksley also mentioned bagged hands and several pieces of bone fragments collected from the living room on BCA 488, page 106. Bagged hands. There's somewhere else when bagged hand was mentioned. A hand was in a bag. And maybe it was when they were re removing the bodies from the scenes and one of the hands fell. I don't know. Bone fragments found next to David and Kamel were labeled as item 039 and item 040. Not to be confused with the other item, the items 39 and 40. That's separately. Those are um, from the property and evidence items. So there's like three or four different sets of items that are found. So I think that kind of threw people off. I know in the beginning that threw me off. So, But you can look at that on page 30 of the property and evidence PDF that we have. If you ever want to go and look at any of those PDFs, you can just go to the graystage.wordpress.com. Right on the main page, just scroll down to the bottom and you'll see all the documents, all of the files, access to everything that we have. Hopefully I didn't miss anything this time. All right, so what else? Um, item 49 is David's fingerprint card. That's an important one. All the effort they went to get the fingerprint card from the FBI. AV-36 is a document with list of, con of contributions found in the printer of the office room. And we've talked about that a lot. Those donors, they're all Minnesota donors, so it's got to be something state level. Um, I'm assuming. I don't know. But where he got those numbers, and the figures are huge. I mean, they those are some serious, serious con contributions. If you just look at the top ten. And, Sophia, I think we have that in the... Um, in the group files the contributions list I don't know if I have that on my website though if I don't I should definitely add that one that would be a good one to add if I don't have that here that contribution list is an important one oh, I think we might have found one I don't have here alright I'll make sure to add that <laughs> okay got a few more minutes here AV-20 and AV-21 are password lists found in the office bedroom. That's BCA 485, page 373. So there are some images of um, some passwords that were found, again, just kind of laying out there. And they were, photo they were clearly photographed. Okay, so here is 36. This is the contributions. This is the first page, DSC 0396. I'm glad I put this one in here, at least. Ada Messenger. I mean, look at those numbers. Nine million. Nine million she's contributing. Brian Sullivan from Steramed. Two million. I mean, this is crazy. InfoSeeker founder. Two million. Premier Technology President. Former U.S. Senator candidate Michael Ceresi, a million. I mean, these are just, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money there. Okay, 9mm am ammunition. 9 millimeter ammunition was found in the basement, but no ammo of 40 cal observed in house or garage, according to Joe Cooksley's written notes, BCA 488, page 106. However, Two boxes of Winchester brand 40 cal Smith & Wesson ammunition and two boxes of Herder's 223 Remington 55 grade FMJ full metal jacket cartridges were found in the trunk of the silver Toyota in the garage. That's from the Property and Evidence, page 3, AV-46, DSC 0384. So... It was kind of a contradictory statement where, um, you know, he says, Joe Cooksley is saying, no ammo of 40 cal observed in the house or garage, but then we have ammo of 40 cal observed in the garage. <laughs> in the trunk of a car, so maybe when he wrote that, he didn't have, they didn't have access to the trunk. Might give us a good indication of 
um, what they accessed, what they didn't access. I don't know. If <laughs> but this is a DSC. It's not a BCA photo, so maybe they didn't. Hard to say. Also found in the trunk of the same car was a Springfield Armory gun case with manuals inside. Here's that Springfield Armory gun case. So this, I guess uh, you have to do this in um, certain states. If you're going to carry, if David was going to carry his gun, it would have to go in here while he was driving. So were they loading up to leave? Were they, you know, is this, did he always have this in his car? Is this why when Sidra came to pick up the car in October of 2014 and David told her to come back in one hour, did he have to take stuff out of that car, the Acura, I believe, and then move everything into this car? That's DSC 0386. All right, and then we have the list here that, again, when I first read this, it threw me off because I, the um, times did not really add up. But this is a list of who, of everybody in the house. Uh, this was taken by, I believe, Chris Booth. But um, I believe that was his name of the AVPD, the same guy who took the dog out of the house, CSO booth hope I'm saying that right um, but he he basically took a list of everybody who went in and out of the house what times so there's that whole list so if you ever want to know who was in there here it is by this one this the one that threw me off two that threw me off because um, it didn't make sense obviously Greg Dahlstrom should have been in the house I would think but he doesn't have an entry time, just an exit time. And Officer Tara Becker, same thing. So maybe they were already in there. Maybe they were in the house. I don't know. But but you have these um, that can help with the times and the dates to show who was in there at what time. We have not only the BCA, the AVPD, but we also have two deputy sheriffs, Brian Olson and Thomas Jacobson, which we haven't really heard much from. Um, so they would probably be good people to reach out to as well. Now they weren't in there till very late, so this says uh, 152, and I'm assuming that's 152, January 18th, and they stayed till 4:15 a.m. With a lot of the investigators, also did that. But um, Sean McKnight was one of the last people to stay there as well. So I don't know. That was just another interesting tidbit there. Uh, another thing that I included in the Notes and Nonsense chapter is the layout of the house. This is also very important to have the layout of the top floor. And this was made on the 17th and the layout of the downstairs floor the exact same way. So the images are lined up. This is the top, this is the bottom looking exactly the same. So you can get a clear view of where everything was. If there was any decomp, anything like that, it should have been right about here. Right about there. So you only have to look at the wall back here. Let's see if you see any decomp there. Going all the way back to the laundry room, another closet. So still curious about the closet, the forensic significance of the closet. But then we go down here, another image. This was taken on, looks like 119 at this point. When this was created. And one of the things you'll notice, you have no item 53 and no item 57 because they don't know about them yet. That's why they're not included here. They have not found them. <laughs> and there's no indication where item 53 it has got to be somewhere in this area and they miss it. They have to come back two days later and find it only because the cleaners tell them about this bullet that rolled out of the carpet 
while they were picking the carpet up. While they were cleaning this house, that's when they find it. So we don't know where item 53 was. We know where that living room carpet was, about this general area. It's rolled up. They're moving it out, and boom, it falls out and lands somewhere over here. <laughs> Crazy. And I think that's even after the couch is moved. So the couch, everything else is moved. Uh, the carpet must have been one of the last things moved. Rolled right out of the carpet. No problem. <laughs> All right, let's get into some of the other stuff that was cut out. According to Mason Hendricks, this one will make your head spin. <laughs> In the beginning, a core group of six or seven people were working on the Gray State Project, according to Mason Hendricks. Danny Crowley Jr. worked on the film with David, but Hendricks felt the two brothers could not work together because of how controlling and egotistical David was. Hendricks told me that. Hendricks felt he and David were both narcissists, but David was worse. <laughs> just got to leave that right there. I'll just set that down right there. Mason Hendricks, Mason Hendricks met Danny Mason during a bullet exchange weapons training session. Danny Mason had pretty much no idea what he was doing, Hendricks told me over the phone. Hendricks stated Danny Mason got butt hurt when he made the actor look like an ass. So everybody's kind of um, trying to one-up themselves. At some point in their relationship, Hendricks found out that he and David had a mutual friend in Sean Wright. What a coincidence. After David's death, according to Mason Hendricks, Sean found out the hard way that it's illegal to not file your income taxes in the state of Minnesota and now is paying lots and lots of fiat currency-based dollars back to the state of Minnesota. Hmm. Well, if you don't pay your taxes now, it looks like you'll have to pay them later. With interest. David was so protective of Kamel, said Hendricks, and I would always fuck with him. Hendricks jokingly told David if he ever got sick of Kamel, he would be he would gladly step in and take his place. Hendricks would also joke around with Kamel. Kamel, are you sick of David yet? Are you sick of this scrawny little man? Whenever you want to hang out with the real man, Kamel, you let me know. Hendricks was also Hendricks was always messing around with David like that. Kamel would laugh and they would hug. It was all in good fun. Regarding the bodies of David, Kamel, and Rania, and because of what the dog did, Hendricks stated, nobody actually knows how they were laid out. Hendricks believed David was controlling Kamel and became a domestic abuser, but not a physical abuser. Nice guy. Regarding the Gray State storyline, I asked Mason Hendricks how the script was supposed to end. Eventually, I did get somewhat of an answer. Hendricks first told me how the movie be began. It starts out somewhere overseas. The viewer is in it, the viewer is instantly thrown into the script with little character development or background information given. An angry female FBI agent was also to play a huge role in the last version of Gray State, according to Hendricks. Hendricks also claimed David wanted to add more of a spiritual element to Gray State, basically taking stuff from all sorts of different religions. All of us thought that was really stupid, said Hendricks, because you basically would be deleting a gigantic base of your core, and then you're also creating a story that is so fucking large that there's no way in hell you would be able to do it into a movie, which, led, which then led to the talks and the ideas of possibly doing like a miniseries. So there you have it. So even Hendricks was aware of this miniseries idea from his own words. Straight out of the, okay. David Kirk West is one of is David Kirk West is the one Hendricks credits for getting David somewhat back on track with sticking to the original concept for Gray State. The concept had changed. By this point, you could tell a lot of things had changed. Additionally, according to Mason Hendricks, David's dad might own or be part of an excess of twenty some patents. Hendricks described David's dad as humble and one of the most brilliant people you would ever meet. If you know what sputtering is, part of the reason why your lovely iPhone is so strong is because of technology that he created. Like with how the glass no longer shatters and all these other things, he's done very, very well for himself financially. Hendricks is talking about David's dad here. 
He started from a garage, creating his own little trinkets, and now has products. And let me start that again. He started from a garage, creating his own little trinkets, and now his products are the most innovative in the realm of glass tampering, glass tempering, and a whole lot of other things in the world. And his patents are all sought after. I'm going to read that one more time just for my own sake. He started from a garage creating his own little trinkets and now his products are the most innovative in the realm of glass tempering and a whole lot of other things in the world and his patents are all sought after. Hmm. One of the last Facebook comments made by David was on a post created by Mason Hendricks, according to Hendricks, which was a post made about myths of Christmas. Gives you an idea of the time. Hendricks also told me David's footprints were a match for the prints found in the kitchen floor. I couldn't find that information in the police reports or in any of the BCA reports, documents, or notes. So what does that tell you? Oh, here we go. Kenneth Maines. I'm going to need a little more coffee for this one. I'm going to go about maybe another 15 minutes and then I'll have to shut this down here <clears throat> the main event for me it is always about the truth no matter where that truth leads me that's Kenneth Maines Kenneth Maines was hired by Dan Hennon to give consultation about the allegations against David Crowley on May 30th 2019 Kenneth Maines sent Dan his full report I want to stress Maines explains to Dan in the report that the conclusion of which I came up with are my opinion I looked at the documents as an unbiased observer of facts in order to come up with the conclusion. Kenneth Maines had one investigative task. He had one job. Give my professional opinion as to the cause slash manner of death and any additional factors that may have led to the deaths. I'm looking at this case with an unbiased view, Maines wrote in his report, as I do all of my cases. My first association with this case came via the police reports and the crime scene pictures I received after being retained by the client, Dan Hennon. Maines added if he were the lead investigator, he would want to know as much as possible about David and Kamel's upbringing, religion, schooling, education, family, mannerisms, hobbies, propensities, etc. As a consultant, I am and can only be concerned with the information provided to me. In this case, we have three victims. When I first read the last sentence, I wondered who was the third victim. Was Maines referring to Paleo? That would make the most sense. But surely he was not implying that David was a victim too, right? It is my opinion, Mr. Maines concluded, that the police are correct in their final conclusion of murder slash suicide committed by David Crowley. If a cover-up by the police is something that individuals want to point the f their finger at, I will say this unequivocally did not happen. A conspiracy by that many sworn police officers with nothing to gain is preposterous and did not happen. It is obvious to me, Maines continued, that David Crowley was diving into a downward spiral of madness. Whether this was from the pressure of having to create Gray Space movie or because his never-ending quest for exploring his beliefs and passion. I am not a psychologist or psychiatrist and will not venture out of my expertise to try to explain why he did this. That question may not ever be answered. So again, we have the downward, downward, spiral, downward spiral of madness. Um, he calls it gray space instead of gray state, though I do kind of like the term gray state, gray space. That's pretty funny. But, um, it, you know, where is this coming from? Where is this madness, this thing where David snapped, where he went crazy? Tom Lydon talks about this shining thing that happened. I mean, where is that? It's not in the documents. Where is it coming from? So I think that's another question that will never be answered that Maines overlooks. Maines also described the collection and documentation of evidence as extremely meticulous and documented very well in my opinion. 
The collection and documentation of evidence was extremely meticulous. Aside from item 57 and item 53 that Maines fails to mention. It's a big deal. Those are two, two big deals. That's why people who want to believe David Crowley is guilty, those are two things that will very rarely ever talk about. And if they do, it's just very, very you know, short. Um, and that's on, you can find that in the main report on page 7. If I don't have that on my website, I'll make sure I get that one up too. Maines believed funding for David's project somewhat faded out. By this, I mean there were some investi- there were some investors, friends, and associates of David and his project that bowed out or were forced out by David. That's a very important point. Who was forced out by David and why? And as many people have asked the question, does that show motive? If the investigators are saying they have not found any reason that anyone other than David could have committed these crimes then they must have looked they must not have looked at possible motive from other people if they did look at possible motive from other people then there is some evidence that shows that somebody other than David could have committed these crimes the other evidence that shows somebody else could have committed these crimes is that there's no evidence that shows David committed the crimes but i guess that's a whole nother issue all right, regarding, uh, regarding the blood writing, Maines wrote, This is done to either stage the scene to look like something it isn't, because it is the motive for the event, or it is for shock value. I like this one. I like this statement here. This is done to either stage the scene to look like something it isn't. That's exactly, that's exactly what I think a lot of us think about this case. A lot of us think about the crime scene that the police walked into. They were walking into a staged scene. Whether you believe David staged that scene or somebody else did, I think it's very clear that it was a staged scene. You can go from there. Maines also believed the incident was not planned. This was an impulse, not planned murder. Well, then how does he spiral? And that's from Maine's report, page 12. Then how does he spiral? Where's the spiraling happen if it's just, you know, a random thing and quote-unquote impulse? How the, the AVPD says David quote-unquote snapped. He went to a dark place. All of this stuff, you know, it's either he planned this or he didn't plan this. So Maine's is saying this was not planned, which to me also throws out any um, any relevance to any pack theory. So you can read the full Maine's report. Dan has covered it. We've done a couple videos on it. And I think um, before you watch those videos or anything, I, I do think it's always best to read the documents for yourself first, then kind of go with that, and then you can you know, hear what other people say. But I, I tend to think the best way is to read it for yourself first. So you're not influenced by anybody else's views or, or thoughts. I know that's not always possible and sometimes with time and you just want to get down to the nitty gritty. So people like Dan, try to make it as easy for you to, to do that without adding in um, her, his own comment, his own comment, commentary, et cetera, et cetera, especially with this video. I think the video Dan made explaining the... Um, results from Kenneth Maine were very good so it's definitely worth watching all right I think this is the last one here fair trade with Danny Mason then there was a time when Danny August Mason wanted to debate Dan Hinnon and myself you can read Danny Mason's post and all of these subsequent comments by members of the Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook group at the same time Danny Mason was posting in the group he also contacted me on Facebook messenger greg don't be annoying mason wrote in facebook messenger you're smart sorry i replied not trying to be annoying just trying to understand the anger seriously i have no idea what you've gone through and can't put myself in your shoes but i hope you'll try to put yourself in mine lots of people have said shitty stuff about us all but you never did as far as i know you get judy danny mason re responded you get judy i get mason hendrix Fair trade. Also, don't, sympath don't sympathize with me. That was a weird, weird statement for him to make. 
I still don't understand what that means. Because I don't want to get Judy. <laughs> I don't want nothing with Judy. And I definitely don't want him to get Danny or to get Mason Hendrix. I don't know what he's talking about. Very strange comment. One of the strangest comments from him. Um, several times during my Facebook conversations with Danny Mason, I asked for evidence of David's guilt. I was not surprised when Danny Mason failed to answer the simple question. Danny Mason called me the irony of Gray State, and I felt the same way about him. Mr. Mason then criticized my debating skills as if we were already debating and I was losing. After all, he took debate class and I did not. Regardless, I'm confident I would win any debate proving David was innocent due to the fact he was never proven guilty. Hey, since I'm such a horrible debater, I wrote back to Danny Mason, then this should be a walk in Central Park for you. It will be recorded, and then you can show everyone, including those you want to pitch Gray State to, how great your, deba your debating skills are. See you then. The Pack. Danny Mason also believed there was a pact between David and Camille to kill their daughter and kill themselves. Camille and David made a pact, Danny Mason wrote in the Justice for David Crowley and Family Facebook group. They didn't consider their daughter Rainy, Rania, who was a daughter to me. I hold a grudge because of that. She was five, Danny Mason continued, and didn't have a choice. So push the buttons, but when it comes to Rani, I get, I'll get very heated because she didn't have a choice. The pack theory also goes against the official theory, the official story, the official narrative. Mr. Mason can't Mr. Mason can believe whatever he wants, but if there was a pact between David and Kamel to kill themselves and their daughter, that would make this case a double suicide murder. A pact theory would not explain why Kamel was shot twice or why she would agree to use her blood to write Allahu Akbar on the wall. If there was a pact then the type note on the living room kitchen island would have said, We have always loved you all with all of our hearts, instead of I have always loved you all with all of my heart. Internal disagreements. Within the Gray State team, there were some internal issues. For example, when Danny Mason posted images of himself as the main character of Gray State with Joe Biggs and Elvis, Mason Hendricks was not happy. Hendricks made an offhanded comment about serving Danny Mason's head on a platter to me if Danny kept up his shenanigans. Clear threat. I was not sure how I would have interpreted that comment, so I didn't pay it much attention at the time. Be clear, I don't want anybody's head on any platter. I'm okay. I'm on a strict diet. Another incident we know of is when the following post was made by one of the admins of the Gray State The Rise Facebook page. Here you go, everyone. David's last edit of the third Gray State trailer. I feel the latest info put out by some admins was misleading and am trying to get some sort of control of the chaos. You're welcome, Sean Wright. As of this, ri as of this writing, the Gray State YouTube channel is still a monetized channel. So every time you watch videos on the Gray State channel, you're supporting people who believe David is guilty. You're welcome. I do not understand why people who believe David murdered his family and committed suicide would want to move forward with the Gray State project, especially those who thought Gray State contributed to the filmmaker's downfall. In order to believe David was guilty, you would have to agree that David wrote Allahu Akbar in his wife's blood on the living room wall. Why would anyone support someone who would do that? Think about it. A guy allegedly murders his five-year-old child, and it's still appropriate to finish his work? On September 11, 2016, Danny Mason posted a new concept trailer. That's the one that Sean Wright was talking about, I, I believe. The Gray State will rise. We have cut a new teaser with footage that was never used, but we have much bigger plans in the works. Details coming soon. More evidence, Danny Mason, moving forward after David's death with the project that David cut Danny Mason out of. Motive. Then on September 13, 2016, an admin for the Gray State page clarified their future intentions, ignoring the facts that many Gray State fans believe David was murdered. It is, definitely we, it is definitely something we had to spend a lot of time figuring out. We needed time to regroup, work on other projects before coming to the, the decision to push forward, and we will. No, you won't. Not if we have anything to say about it. You won't. 
One of the more humorous comments made by an admin of the Grey State The Rise Facebook page came after someone asked, where can I get the Grey State film? The answer posted by the admin still makes me laugh in the future. I like how they added the three extra dots. too. <laughs> asked why they believe David was guilty, the Grey State Facebook page responded with the very extensive and thorough police investigations came to the conclusions that David Crowley was the cause of this tragic event that happened. It's heartbreaking and hard to totally comprehend still. Personally, I found the official theory hard to comprehend as well, especially since evidence for David's guilt seemed non-existent. So the admin for the Gray State continued, while people can spend all the time they want trying to figure out what the, the nefarious and heinous plan by the New World Order was, the fact of the matter is that the only nefarious and heinous plan was that of David's which his friends and family that are still here will be left asking why for the rest of our lives. But they won't ask how, they won't ask if. The admin was sure to remind people that the Gray State Project would continue, regardless of what David may have been saying in the months leading up to the tragedy. He was never alone on working on Gray State. There are plenty of videos and interviews out there that show that. So we will continue, and we will do our best to make Grey State something we feel the fans will love and appreciate. Here's a comment from someone known as Reaper. Crowley was my brother in arms. We served in Iraq together in Ram Ramadi in 2006. We were in the same platoon. This pick is the best squad competition in Germany, where we were stationed. <coughs> I last spoke with him around November. 2014. He was fine. Anyone who knows him knows he didn't do this. I love you, Crowley. You will be missed, brother. Your fight is over. Rest easy. I pray his legacy is carried on and Grey State is finished. The world needs to see it. See you in Valhalla, brother. And here's that photo. Okay, almost done. Spirituality. Danny Mason stated he and David never talked about Christianity, Muslims, or Islamic beliefs. If anything, Detective Tommy Booth reported, Mr. Mason thought that they may be atheists. That's AVPD Police Reports, page 31. Mitch Heil and David also never talked about Christianity or religion. Heil stated Kamel converted to Christianity so she and David could get married. According to Detective Tommy Booth, he stated that Kamel had given up her Muslim status for David and knew that her family was not happy about it. ABPD reports, page 34. Mason Hendricks once stated he and David talked a lot about Norse mythology, Greek mythology, Islam, Christianity, you name it. So he's talking, David is talking with Mason Hendricks about all this stuff, but nobody else. According to Alec Wilkinson's article, the New Yorker on art on October 30th, 2014, David wrote, Camille got raptured today. She's still here. The New Yorker magazine, April 10th, 2017, page 26. David held Camille as she explained there was something wrong, according to Alec Wilkinson's article. Wilkinson reported that David said in a phone recording, Wilkinson reported what David said in a phone recording about the incident. Something about, David recounted, do not fear, sweet body. For we have felt this pain together. Don't worry about the pain, because you do not know how to feel pain, and you will return to the dust and your dark slumber, and I will be gone. Kamel apparently heard an Egyptian woman's scary voice and wondered if David had heard it, the voice as well. I have my mission, the voice told Kamel. I've warned you. I want you. Please come with me. Please come with me. Your place won't come to me. There's nothing left here. This is what rapture is, Kamel said to David. Later that same day, David reminded Kamel of some of the other things the voice said through her. You said you'd come from very far to find me, and Ronnie and I need to come with you, and there's not much time. The primary emotion was that of like desperate, desperate love, like hopeless love, and on some level your soul has committed to mine, and we're going to go somewhere, and Ronnie's coming with. All right, 
Thank you all for joining me here. Until we meet again, until next time, God bless you all.
good morning, good afternoon, good evening. What a, what a great show we had last night recording for podcast episode number 15, sticking to just item 53. Um, now, I apologize to my co-hosts because I had thought that uh, we were, you know, we were going to keep the podcast to under 50 minutes, under 60 minutes. We really need, I really need to do that. I really need to get better at that. Um, I think we went about 100 and 140. We went about um, uh, over 90 minutes, um, one hour, 45 minutes, I believe. So um, do apologize for that too, keeping everybody up late. It was our only chance that I would have for a while to record that podcast. So uh, because we do want to try to make sure that we get a new podcast out on the first of every month. And I want to thank all the, of the co-hosts that were able to to join last night. And um, when I was going through some of the notes, you know, obviously we were looking at item 53, episode number 15 of the Gray Stage podcast. And it's really only about two pages long. So I figured there wouldn't be that much. And then I started going through the BCA lab report. It's about 40 pages long. And just seeing if I missed anything, seeing what I could find on item 53. And that really opened up a can of worms. So um, I think if we wouldn't have covered the BCA document, probably could have kept it under one hour. So we'll see. Um, maybe I'll break it up into two shows. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure yet, but... I will be editing that show down a little bit later on and hope to have that up this evening. So, But a lot of things came up um, regarding the white substance on item 53. What's interesting is there was a white substance found on three bullets. Um, the one was, was item 45, which is the bullet that lodged itself into the basement. There was white material found on that one. There was white material found on item 57, which is the one that police will find one month later and um, that will be in the attic above the living room so those kind of make sense but we were wondering where the where did this white substance come from that was on item 53 so if anybody has any thoughts on that your guess is as good as mine but i'd love to hear some views about what that could possibly be how um because item 53 didn't go through any walls or anything like that. It rolled out of a carpet. Uh, this was another bullet that was not found when police left the crime scene. Um, the first crime scene, I guess, I don't know. You could say either there's three different crime scenes or you have, you know, three times where they, two times where they returned to the original crime scene. So whatever, whatever we want to say that is, we know that um, they, found item 53 on January 20th and they found the bodies January 17th and then they'll find item 57 they'll find that on uh, February 18th so that's the chain of events um, because I wanted to kind of stick to item 53 um, it's kind of out of out of order meaning the suspicious activity chapter Item 53 is mentioned a couple of pages in. So for episode number 16, we'll definitely be going back, taking a little bit of a backtrack um, for the next show, which will focus on item 57. We may have to break that down into two shows as well. I'm uh, probably going to run the timer on the next one just so I kind of know. Because um, time flies, basically, especially when we're talking about this stuff. But looking through the BCA 40-page document, I was able to find a lot of stuff that, um, you know, I, I kind of was like, why didn't I put this in the book? Why didn't I put that in the book? And I think it's because, you know, some of the things needed to be put in without my commentary. So the white substance, the hairs slash fibers that were found on item 53 are in there, but that's pretty much it. There's no reasoning. So we go, we talk about that stuff. And that's what I love about this podcast is we're able to take a few paragraphs from my book and actually expand on it um, and just dis discuss it more so but I would love to hear anybody's thoughts about anything related to the podcast once you hear it and um, specifically about item 53 and what that white substance could have could have been 
Uh, obviously, it would have had, I mean, it would make sense if it was drywall. But again, this bullet did not go through any walls. On the diagrams, if you've ever seen the diagrams that show the 57, you know, item one, item two, show all of these items where they found, um, I know it's item 53 is not on there. So that kind of piqued my interest and my curiosity. I was like, okay, well, item 53 isn't there. Um, even in those 40 pages, item 53 is not mentioned very much. And um, that's kind of bothersome because item 53 is a big, big deal. It's one of the items that has missing DNA or unknown DNA, an unknown DNA source or sources on it, similar to the notepad found in David's office bedroom. So we talk about all of that stuff. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear everybody's thoughts, what your views are on that as well. So I, I look forward to it. I look forward to the, to the feedback as always. Um, 15 shows in now, and I feel like we're really finding our groove with this podcast. We're getting our groove back. <laughs> But it was nice to have everybody up. Dan joined us, obviously. Uh, Catherine joined us, and so Sophia joined us. Anne is back. She joined us as well. And Stephen Sanziri also joined us. So um, it was a great roundtable of uh, people that we had there. That's another reason why it can go, go a little long. It didn't really feel long. Um, we even stayed after the recording and kind of chatted about different things too so all in all i would say it was a really interesting podcast i'm glad everybody was there glad everybody could join us for so late i like the afternoon um better i feel like i'm more there (laughs) and not as tired obviously after a full day's work and everything so but it was definitely worth it i'm glad that we got to to record the podcast and i do hope to have that up today so be looking for that looking forward to it looking forward to your feedback i just wanted to share those thoughts with you um the gray stage podcast uh or the gray stage youtube channel please make sure that you check that out and if you can subscribe to it that would be great there's also a secondary channel uh the david crowley questions youtube channel that we have too so um i'll try to add some more content to that channel as well just for the research you know i try to put the most important things um on that channel it's kind of like another backup channel as well nothing wrong with backups so but i was very disturbed about how little item 53 is actually mentioned in any of these documents there's like a note section um in the bca 40 page report and in the note section, you know, they mentioned that they were at the house January 17th. They left on January 18th. They mentioned 218, so they mentioned the day that they had to come back for item 57, but they completely skip over item 53. And I'm not sure why. Um, why is it? Why is it not in the in those diagrams either? It should be in the, some one of the diagrams where they found item 53. Maybe it's in the notes. The, the handwritten drawing diagrams. I'll, we'll have to go back and check that out. But the 40-pager has an 11-page report by Joe Cooksley. Item 53 is not really mentioned there. It should be. It really should be. Item 57 is not really mentioned there either. But it looks like they went back and kind of added um, some of the stuff about item 57. I don't understand why they didn't add some of the stuff about item 53. The weight of item 53 is also another thing. It's about 100 and 169 grams. So, um, but if it can only be a max of 180 grams, um, it just, you know, item, the other bullets don't have any white substance on them. They all went through people. Um, it's also interesting about item 53 is that there was only blood found on one area. So again, it's like, well, how do you get two DNAs, two DNA sources or more, including Rania, in one area? 
it's very important to note that um, there is no indi indication that when the cleaners, when this bullet rolled out of the carpet for these cleaners, there's no indication that the cleaners picked up the bullet or anything like that. So I was thinking, well, maybe it was their DNA. Um, it's also not clear if when it says two or more DNA profiles, if, you know, if it's blood or if it's, um, you know, how did, how did they get that DNA? I'm assuming it can't be blood. I mean, that would just be odd because we know that item 53 did not have uh, David's or Kamel's blood or DNA on it. So the missing DNA profile, like Sophia, I think she had brought that up last night, is that we don't know if that's blood or if it's just a nuclear DNA source. So that's what we'll have to look into next. So a lot of different things to look into, but um, just wanted to kind of throw, throw that out there. Thank everybody. Um, if you ever need any documents, you can go to thegraystage.wordpress.com and you will find all of those documents, whatever documents that you, you need. Um, you will also find um, the photos and uh, my, my book. If you want to download my book free, please do. Uh, I, think, I think it's a really good starting point. And... Uh, join the Facebook group that we have. We're almost at 4,000 members. Justice for David Crowley and family. The only Facebook group that is uh, talking about this case that really matters. Uh, the only one that is looking into this case. Not just slandering people. So That's always a good thing. But I mean, we are the only, the only group that is trying to get justice for this family. That is trying to find... Um, trying to let people know what the facts are about this case uh, the facts are all in these documents you can clearly see that so all you got to do is look it's all right there so um, I think that's about all I wanted to kind of cover just some of the weird you know just the weird things with item 53 that kind of bothered me and I don't know um, and we have maybe five or six photos of item 53 where it landed when it when it rolled out of that carpet so the cleaners are moving the carpet they're picking the carpet up it's already rolled up they're picking it up and this bullet rolls out and lands uh, on the same wall where the where the the blood writing is so pretty interesting how they could miss that first of all um, what they found on it and they needed to find item 53 they needed to find a bullet that had com that had Rania's DNA on it because none of the other bullets that they found when they left that crime scene none of those bullets had Rania's DNA on it none of the bullets had David's DNA on it either so very interesting there um, very interesting stuff so that's kind of it, trying to figure out, okay, where would the bullet had to have been for them to miss it? What side of the carpet, front side, back side? Uh, but that white substance, I think, is really one that stands out, really stood out to, I think, everybody on, on the show last night, for good reason. Next month, what month are we in? This will be April, so you'll be... You'll be listening and watching uh, the podcast. The audio version will be out later today. The video version might take a few days. I want to add a few things into the video version, but it was a it was a really good show, and we'll just keep marching forward just to let every everybody know what the facts are, what the documents say, and you're gonna have to make up your own mind about what you think. And that's your, that's your choice. So God bless you all. Until next month, what is, where are we in? April, May. So May 1st, we'll come back with item 57. Most likely that will be a two-part show. And we'll discuss everything we know about item 57. I don't know if we can get that into one show. But I will try to keep that one down to 60 minutes. Uh, I want to keep all of these down. To under 60 minutes if possible and like I said we probably could have if I wouldn't have um, gone through the BCA documents 
and put that stuff in there. Probably would have been able to keep it under 60 minutes. So, Until next time, you know where to find the podcast. You can find it on our anchor.fm. You can find it on pretty much anywhere you get your, your podcast from. So please check that out. God bless you all. And until next time. Okay, let me do that quickly here. Uh, I think I got it on my phone. Where are you? It's just I only have two recordings. It's kind of weird. Dan, whenever you want to start. Go okay, ahead. go ahead and go ahead and calm me down and I'll start it out. Sure. All right, we are starting episode number 15 in 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the next podcast episode of the book, The Gray Stage, authored by Greg Fernandez Jr. Today is episode number 15. We'll be covering chapter 9 in the book. With us is Greg Fernandez. How are you doing today, Greg? Hey, I'm doing very good, Dan. Thank you for uh, for joining us here. Appreciate that, as always. Great. We're going to be, uh, for those following along at home, we'll be on page 70. If you're following along in the book, there's an item called, a section called Item 53 is where we're going to be starting today. Also joining us is uh, Sophia, Catherine, and Stephen, and I think uh, Anne as well. Welcome. Thank hey, you. Hey, how you doing? So what I'll do for the episode here tonight, um, um, I'll read it, and then I'll, I'll read a couple paragraphs, and we'll have some discussion about uh, some of the details, and I'll move along uh, from there. So let's get started. On January 20th, 2015, Biotech Emergency Services, the company hired to clean the crime scene, was in the process of removing items from the residence when a mushroom bullet, item 53, rolled out of the living room carpet. This spent cartridge had some white material on the surface, weighed 169.54 grams, and was found with an expanded nose. Quote, I was contacted by the cleanup team while they were in process, end quote. Detective Sean Wright wrote in his report about item 53. Continuing, they stated that they had located a bullet that had been rolled up in the carpet. The bullet had rolled out under the hardwood floor that had already been cleaned. End quote. Uh, any any comments on those first two? Uh, there actually is a lot. Where should we start, though? I guess, Greg. <laughs> um, well, you may want to. Uh, maybe I could have you reread that second paragraph there because you said detective sean wright and um though i yeah. have my views on who sean wright he might be involved oh. with informants okay here we go <laughs> just read that again. i'll read this Thanks. i'll read this again sorry a freudian slip <laughs> paragraph two quote i was con- contacted by the cleanup team while they were in process detective sean mcknight wrote in his report about item 53 they stated that they had located a bullet that had been rolled up in the carpet. The bullet had rolled out under the hardwood floor that had already been cleaned, end quote. A lot of information there. Where should we start, Greg? Well, I think, um, you know, the main thing is when this bullet was was found. Um, The bullet was found on January 20th, which is, you know, if the police didn't leave until January 18th, that's two days later, we could say three days, uh, whatever it is, it's, that's a, that's a big deal that I think gets kind of overlooked 
And I think as we go on here, as we look at some of these documents too, we're going to see that that it's kind of item 53. And, and even me, when I first looked at this stuff, I didn't really pay that much focus to item 53. It was other people in our group. Thank God for all these other people in our group who were looking at, at these documents and pointed out some of these strange things that we're going to see about item 53. But the fact that it rolled out of the living room carpet it's fascinating. It's baffling. I don't understand how that's even possible. So can anybody, does anybody have any idea, shed any light on how a bullet, a magic bullet, one of two magic bullets, how does the bullet not get found when the police leave, when the investigators leave, when the BCA team leaves, the sheriff's office, all these people that are in this house, and nobody sees this bullet that rolls out of, of a carpet, of the living room carpet, where the bodies were taken out. That's so, so if I could uh, start off there, Greg, uh, for, for the newer listeners out there, you know, the bodies were found January 17th, and they were there. They conducted uh, uh, the investigation, cleaned everything up on the 18th. Uh, 19th, the cleaning crew was already in there, and now this is the 20th. This is day two of the cleaning service. And by rolling out, I think what happened is that they rolled up the carpet to clean underneath it. Uh, the living room in the Crowley family doesn't have carpet on the on the floor or attached to the floor. It's just a hardwood floor, uh, but there's an area rug. And I think this is what they're referring to here is the area rug when they refer to the carpet. So the cleaners, I think, rolled up the rug to get it out of the way so they can clean, mop, and, you know, mop up the floor. And that's when it came out. Um, that's my impression. Is that what you think uh, uh, as well, Greg? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. The way that I read it, at least, given them, yeah, looking at their documents. And, and maybe Stephen would know what would be the white white uh, material found on the surface, and that it depends on it weighing 169 grams. Uh, to those of us not in law enforcement, does that mean anything to us, uh, Stephen? Um, what what the weight well, is? Well, you know. It, yeah, you know, I looked this up earlier because it's been a while, but the, the 9 millimeter, the bullet weight uh, is anywhere from 115 to 165 grams or grains. Um, some people call them grams or grains, but 165 is the highest. And what, what did you say the bullet weight was? 140-something? Uh, 169.54 grams. Oh, okay, so it was a heavy load. 165 is a max on 9 millimeter. Uh, I think that bullet possibly, guys, the weight went into the ceiling. It, that's what the white stuff is, sheetrock, and it, it just, from the angle, didn't stick. It dropped out. And well, that's what I'm thinking. Okay, so we've got a 40 caliber uh, mushroom, not a 9 millimeter. And this oh, is I'm not so the, sorry. This is not the bullet that went to the ceiling. This was found in the carpet. Uh, oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Okay. And gotcha. the other thing, I think, I think what you're getting at, Greg, on your first question was how did it come out? I think, I think the... It was just embedded into that rug. Therefore, no one saw it sitting on the top. And when they rolled it, it came out from the bottom is probably what happened. Uh, or it could have not. easily, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dan, but it could have easily yeah. also rolled underneath the sofa. And um, as they're moving furniture and they're getting stuff out of the way, and then as they're starting to roll up the rug, um, you know, then it falls out. So when you're looking at um, how they say it was found three feet, one inch from the, the south wall and one foot ten inches from the kitchen. I mean, when you're looking at, at their um, description of where this was found, it sounds to me like it was really close to, to the main wall that had the writing on it in blood. So that would put it real close to where the sofa was. So maybe my thought is maybe it after whatever, it rolled underneath the sofa, nobody saw it, and you know, until they're rolling it up, and then poof, it falls out. Hmm, that would make sense, yeah. And the carpet was underneath the sofa, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so that would make sense. But then what is this white stuff? What is... I, white? I had, you know, and that's why I was asking to look at those photos. I don't see any white stuff. So, But, of course, we don't see the um, the mushroom den that's actually lying on the floor. But, yeah, the white that and they don't really clarify. I've been trying to find that. Yeah, that's, that's part of uh, Joe Cooksley's notes. That was something that I just kind of noted there because I was trying to find anything on item 53, um, and I couldn't, couldn't, really couldn't find that much on it. But um, so I don't know what 
the white stuff is, like you said, we only have, what, four or five photos of that bullet, and we only, you know, and they only film it, or um, they only have photos of, of the bullet where it lands, so like you said, we don't really know where the bullet was, they don't know where the bullet was, and maybe that's why it's not included in any of their 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 diagrams, which is something I want to talk about later. And the other thing for this um, important thing to note for the listeners here, uh, this is January 20th, so this is day two of the cleaners. Now, we have to keep in mind that January 19th, the day before, is when several members of David Crowley's Gray State team, project team, were in the house doing something that caused uh, a neighbor to call 911 for suspicious activity. So they were already in the house at this time the day before. So the cleaning had not been done yet. The cleaning had been started, but the cleaning of the house had not been concluded. So this was day two, and I think they wrapped up on this day. So they were just doing the final cleanup here, and um, that's when they found this this bullet. And so you got to remember the the Gray State guys have already been <laughs> sitting in the living room on those couches or, or whatever, uh, you know, the very day before, in the process of the cleaning taking place. And so Stephen might be able to answer this, wouldn't the house, the house would be secured, um, right, because the cleaning is still being done, um, but would the scene still be all uh, taped off with yellow tape at this point, or was it cleared at that point from that from the investigator's perspective? perspective? You know what, um, the ones we always, it, it did even have a, a cop parked outside, I mean, kind of crime scene like that, until everybody got out of there, because cleaning companies, you know, I mean, look what they found. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, and they had yeah, to, I mean, yeah. they had to call the uh, cops to to tell them that this bullet was yeah. there. What about the weight? What do you think about the weight of this? Is that um, is that I mean, is that relevant? I put that in here to try to figure out the weight of the different bullet. I wish I had the weight of the other bullets right up here with me, but um, I was very right. curious about that weight because obviously, if it, it goes right through this daughter's head, which is what we are talking about, the mm-hmm. back of the ear, it looks like, um, mm-hmm. not that much is going to, it's not going to take that much weight off of it, right? So, I don't know. 169 grams, almost 170. Yeah, the high, uh, the 40 caliber highest, highest, it goes up to about 180 on a load, so the 165 is a common load, so if that had more oh, yeah. weight on it. You're right, um, Stephen. It says on the box this is 180 grams. Oh wow, good to know. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, they get about seven or different sizes, but 165 plus whatever's on it, maybe. We get 165 grain too. So does that help us see how far it would have traveled from hitting the daughter and then going into this magic area that nobody in none of the investigators or anybody in the house can find it? until three days later when they're told about it by this biotech emergency services? Yeah, well, the bullet could change angles and everything and after it struck bone or it struck something else. And it couldn't have traveled too far, right? Because that living room, Dan no. might know this because Dan's been in the actual living room here. It, mm. couldn't, have tra- it couldn't have gone that far. Um, trying to understand maybe the, the distance of where the daughter would have to have been shot. Close range and maybe um, maybe Catherine or Sophia or Anne kind of know more about that because they've looked extensively over and over at the the autopsies and um, about the suit and the stippling and all that stuff. Maybe there's some interesting stuff there. I haven't looked at it in a while, but to understand how close the bullet was when it when when she was shot, I think would be would be something that I thought that the investigators would have look deeper into the fact that they really don't mention item 53 that much is very bothersome and i think many people looking into the case just don't don't know that they really don't know that and looking at the documents i can i can see why well another thing is they may want to uh, diminish it to some extent because it's it's once again it's something that they missed 
Mm -hmm. Item 57 they missed, and so they tried to downplay it. Item 53 they missed, and they tried to down downplay it. I think is uh, the embarrassment is is part of it. I think. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. Mm -hmm. it, it and I don't think a lot of people understand that that living room was pretty small. Uh, after you look at the photos and you get an idea of where everything was, I'm, I'm, I was surprised to find that it was as small as it was. Because, yeah, it's not a big, uh, it's not a big room um, being in it. Uh, and I was in it, you know, so it's not that large of a room to begin with, but yes, uh, it puts it into perspective when you see how close at close corners everything is um, on site there. Exactly. So when they say they, they stated that they had located a bullet that had been rolled up in the carpet, um, so they they roll up the carpet with the bullet in there, and the bullet rolled out under the hardwood floor that had already <laughs> been cleaned. I'm having a hard time understanding this, but I think Catherine, I think I think you kind of hit it there, kind of shows that it was underneath. The, it, the bullet went through the carpet. Is that what you're kind of saying, Catherine? Is that what you no, think? actually, I mean, I don't know if it went through the, the rug or not. I mean, um, looking at the photos, it, uh, there's some white fibers stuck within the, the mushroomed portion of the mm -hmm. fragment. To me, that looks like part of the rug is stuck inside there. But I'm just saying that when it, wherever it came from, did it bounce off something? I don't know. Or did it just come... Oh, I hate to sound so crude, but did it just exit and um, then roll after, you know, it came, exited the, the head? Did it then roll underneath the couch? I'm just saying somehow, some, it's a possibility mm -hmm. that maybe it rolled underneath the couch, and that's why it wasn't found until they're rolling up the rug. And, Greg, I think I see what you're talking about as far as uh, the comment. I think he worded it wrong the way Scott, uh, Sean McKnight wrote this. You're, you're, you're getting stuck on, I think, Greg, where it says the bullet rolled out under the hardwood floor. Right. <laughs> well, right. It, it obviously didn't roll under the hardwood floor. It rolled out under the carpet and bounced around and landed on, the hard, on top of the hardwood floor. But the way Sean McKnight has it worded is that he actually does say it went under the hardwood floor. So that, that's... Obviously, an error is what I'm, I'm guessing is how he meant it. Yeah. He didn't yeah, mean yeah. to write it like that. Yeah, I think he kind of meant under the under the rug. It, the way that I really read it is under the rug, but yeah, I mean, obviously, it didn't go under the hardwood floor. So, But they had it. It sounds to me like they rolled up that, that area rug first to clean the hardwood floor, and then while they were unrolling it, perhaps, or moving around, that that rolled up carpet already, it came out. That's how I understood it. Okay. Yeah. While they were moving it, once it's rolled up, and while they're moving it out of the house, then it then it rolls up, which is also kind of weird when you look at where, and and I I will add in this in the video version, I'll add some of the few photos that we do have. But when you look at where it landed, it pretty much landed on the same wall where the blood writing was. So that's also another curious thing. By this time, the couch has obviously moved. Um, it, it had to, I, I'm guessing, but I'm assuming that it would have had to have been moved based on the photo that we've seen that was taken a few days after. Um, it was already moved pro probably by January 19th. Um, that couch had been moved for whatever reason, which is also another strange thing. But um, it does look like, it, I mean, the bullet r rolls next to that wall. Um, so... Where were they moving it to? Where were they moving this rug? It kind of it, that made me think they're moving the rug out the back door, not out the front door, for it to have rolled that way. Unless you got two people on one side, a smaller guy uh, on the north side. If you're looking at at the house, I guess, or just looking at north and south on the diagram that we will show up here too. Um, it's just kind of weird how it rolls out and how it just lands in this area here. It's very, very curious to me. Now, we definitely know that they had to find a bullet for Rania because at this point they didn't have one, but I'm jumping ahead here, sorry. I'll continue on with the next uh, paragraph. Quote, 
At approximately 1,300 hours on 1-20-2015, 20, 20, Detective Brian Bone reported, quote, Detective McKnight was contacted by the company cleaning up the Crawley residence at the request of David's father. The cleanup crew personnel notified Detective McKnight that they had discovered a bullet at the residence. They relayed to Detective McKnight that while picking up the rug from the main living room area, a bullet had come out of the carpet and fallen to the floor, end quote. Hmm. So, so it pretty this much is, matches, right? It matches yep, yep. The two things. And this is uh, January 20th, which would have been a Tuesday, 1,300 hours. So we're talking 1 o'clock, 1 p.m. in the afternoon on a Tuesday uh, David's father, you know, it looks like he's the one who arranged for this biotech emergency services to come in. They found it, and uh, and then uh, they found this uh, bullet and called Detective McKnight. Now, looking at that bullet, the bullet comes out of the of the carpet. How far could that bullet have rolled? I guess too was another another question. Um, rolls almost perfectly where you can see everything that you need to see with that bullet. All right, I'll continue on. Detective Bowen photographed the bullet when he and Detective McKnight entered the house. Quote, I found that the bullet was lying approximately one foot ten inches from the west wall of the living room, wrote Detective Bowen, and approximately three feet one inch from the south corner wall, which leads to the dining area of the residence, end quote. It should be noted, Bone continued, that the bullet was predominantly flat on the back and was sitting on the front slash mushroom portion of the bullet. The bullet appeared to be mostly intact at the time of our discovering it, end quote. Now, I, I got to say, when I first saw that bullet, you know, it, the way that it mushroomed to me was kind of weird. But that's because I've never seen a bullet that has gone through a person or, you know, never seen a, a bullet in that, uh, the way that it landed. Um, but I, I think the one thing, um, it, was, it was clean. I remember I noticed that the bullet was pretty much very, very clean. And... Um, uh, sitting on the front mushroom bullet, the bullet appeared to be mostly intact. Time of our discovering it. So, yeah, there wasn't really that that much that much damage or anything done done to it. It was just kind of there. And and oh, the other thing. Here's the thing that I wanted to mention um, was that nowhere in these documents does it say that the cleaning crew or anybody had touched this bullet. That's going to be a very important piece when we get to the. DNA. Um, it's very important to note that that nobody says that they touched it, nobody picked it up, or anything like like that. Um, I just want to make that clear because I went back and I double checked that to make sure. And and Greg, it's important too. Uh, you had mentioned earlier the the investigators at this point, prior to this day, only had three bullets picked up from the scene. And there was three dead people, so they just assumed that each person was shot once. Uh, problem solved. And now they get this call saying another one was found. So it, it didn't necessarily leave them scratching their heads, but uh, it would have left them thinking, you know, was was someone shot twice, and if so, uh, why? Mm. And now we know that a, a month later, they find it, they get a call from another person that there's another bullet missing. <laughs> Uh, the comedy continues. All right. So they find it. It's 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 laying there. Uh, they discover it. They photograph it and whatnot. Now moving on, it says item 53-1 is a swabbing item from item 53. Is a swabbing from item 53. Hairs found on the bullet were labeled as item 53-2. This bullet contained a blood mixture of two or more individuals with the major DNA profile matching Rania. Interestingly, David and Kumel were excluded from being contributors to the newly found bullet. Based on those results, authorities should have been looking for a second DNA profile. Unlike 
some other results, it is not stated that 99% of the general population can be excluded from contributing to the blood mixture of item 53. What I find interesting about that sentence is this bullet contained a blood mixture of two or more individuals. So they're talking about blood, like from two or more individuals or Rania's blood mixed with DNA from two or more individuals. Mm. Um, the way that it's stated, I'm confused by this because, and there's a reason why I'm trying to get to the bottom of this because for David's bullet, it's stating that there was no blood found, but his DNA was found on it. And some are saying that it was his blood. On item 53? On item 57. Oh. This is why I'm trying to get the clarification for item 53 first. Okay. So that when we get to item 57, we can determine whether or not that was from skin cells or if saliva or whatever, or if it was legit blood. Well, from item 57, it was not from blood. So anybody who says that it was doesn't know what, what they're talking about or needs to go back and just read these. Look at, look at these documents here, and you can, you can clearly see it. Um, for item 53, um, yeah, it does look a l I'm not, I'm not sure. You're right. Um, it's hard, it's hard to tell if they're talking about blood on two or more or if they're talking about just DNA. Now, the reason why I would assume blood is, uh, based on the BCA, um, 40 page report that we are also looking here, looking at here too. Um, because that does say that they found blood in one area of this bullet, one area. So how do you get a mixture of two or more people and you find blood in one area? Unless we're talking about blood in one area and then DNA in one area, but then again, that would show that somebody had to put their DNA on it, and we know it wasn't David, and we know it wasn't David's wife, this is one of two areas where we have missing <coughs> DNA, similar to the uh, to the to the notepad that was found in David's office. Could that be the same missing DNA? The same missing DNA that we see on item fifty three dash one is it the same person or persons? Because they're saying a mixture of two or more. It could be more people. And what makes me curious about the blood that was found in the kitchen, because it was never tested, but I'm assuming that's from the killer. And if they would have tested it, then we would have been able to at least answer the question of the DNA and been able to see if it was also matching item 53 and the notepad and, you know, anyway. Could have, would have, should have. <laughs> and what I find interesting on, on actually both 53 and 57, but we're sticking with 53 tonight, is where it states major profile would not be expected to occur more than once among unrelated individuals in the world population. So in other words, they're stating that, that if um, they're, the way this is worded and what it says to me is that the other DNA profile is coming from someone who is related to either the Crowley's or Camille's fam uh, either Camille or David's family. Because if they wouldn't expect to find it more than once in an unrelated individual, that leaves a whole lot of other people. You know what I mean? In other words, hopefully you guys understand what I'm trying to say. I'm tired. <laughs> that you. leads me back to the gun safe and the type of DNA test that they ran on that. They Correct. were looking for a relative. Correct. And when they say that David and Kamel are excluded and um, they're not expecting this DNA to come from an unrelated person, well, then what does that tell you? Uh, tell, what, what does that tell us in, in general? You know, it's like, hmm. 
And, and I agree, they should have taken it further. They should have tested a whole lot more. Mm-hmm. I agree. <laughs> It's only you know, picking up guys' uh, f- uh, DNA off a fingerprint is about 65 to 70 percent of the time they'll get DNA off, DNA off a fingerprint. So they haven't disclosed if it's blood or or fingerprint DNA, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, good question. Yeah, they should. So, I mean, they said they only found blood on one area of this bullet. Yeah, because yeah, when I when you look at that the photos of that um, fragment that that um, it is clean compared to the other fragments, you know, the, especially the ones that have Kamel's hair and and blood and stuff on it. I mean, that looks like it went through someone's head. Sad but true. But you look at this one, and and I'm hard pressed to see where it actually went through a body. It's very yeah. clean. I agree, Catherine. I absolutely agree. And at least here they say they found blood on one part of the bullet. Where you go to item 57 and they say that they didn't find blood on that bullet. Correct. Yeah, they found DNA. Correct. Right. Item 57 did not have blood. So obviously they were checking all over the entire bullet. Mm Mm-hmm. Pretty interesting stuff there. I don't know what what to think what to think about that. Um, and I think a lot. Can you guys of people, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Hello, William. I think he's having uh, trouble hearing us, but um, I'll let him know that we can hear you. So, William, it's your technical difficulties. <laughs> can you hear us, William? <clears throat> So what, uh, Greg, in the, in the comment in your book is very good here. It says, based on those results, the authorities should have been looking for a second DNA profile. And we don't have any evidence that they did no, any other okay. further research or examination to see who that other person was. Dave and Kamel were excluded. We already know that Rania was the major contributor, which leaves us with who, yeah, who else. Mm-hmm. So that's a good point. Welcome, William. Can you hear us? I think he's working out. He's, he's got some gremlins over there trying to ah. stop him from, from joining us. And that's what happened. We've got one paragraph left. Should I wrap that one up, Greg? Yeah, sure. Final paragraph is, since authorities did not discover this spent round on their own, we will never know where item 53 landed after allegedly killing Rania Crowley. What we know for sure is that item 53 rolled out of the living room carpet on January 20th, 2015. What we still need to know is the source of this missing DNA profile or profiles associated with this bullet. Now, I I would think that just this here would warrant a new investigation or to continue the investigation? Do we need to present to them, to the AVPD, do we need to to present to them some of the other, do we need to find the DNA source for them? I mean, shouldn't they be looking for this DNA source? Why did they not, it's not like there's just one, there's obviously two here. Who at this point, at uh, January, February fifteenth, twenty fifteen, who is who is in charge of this investigation, and who is who is looking at um, this DNA and saying, well, yeah, there's somebody else here, but we're not going to even go there. I mean, I would assume by looking at this that the investigation should have kept going on. There should have been some type of follow up to item fifty three and to item 41. And we're not seeing that. So the investigation cannot be closed. It's, it could be one more reason why it's, it's never closed, why it's ruled exceptionally cleared. But shouldn't the police put some effort into this now, into finding these two DNA sources? Or are we, what, we're six, six years later? Uh, is that just a lost cause 
at this point, but how do they account for this missing, the two missing DNA sources? This is stuff that I wish I would have known when I, when we had the opportunity to ask Detective Gummer the 21 questions. It's things like this that make me very angry that it took so long for us to get this data. It was like stalling and stalling and stalling, and even now there's still stuff that they're stalling me on. After all of this time here, there shouldn't be any stalls here. If they believe David Crowley is guilty, they should be able to lay it out in black and white. And all we see is just a gray stage here. And that's why we are here. That's why we are looking for justice. That's why we will continue to look for justice for this family. Because who else is going to do it? Right. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. So, Stephen, um, who would be responsible for that if, you know, this, um, these results show up to the detectives? Would it be the responsibility of the detectives to say, okay, we need to start looking in a different direction, or is it the lab's responsibility? Do you know? Uh, no, it would be, be the Office of Detectives, the police department, to drive that in to answer your question, we'd have to you know, take it as a PI case and get an attorney involved and write, write it up and, and try to submit it you know, to the DA. You know, and it's about the only route and see if they reopen the case, but it's up to the cops to push any kind of um, uh, evidence. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this, this is Dan. If this was, once again, if we put it in terms of a court case, uh, this missing bullet that was just found wouldn't be admissible in this case at all anyway. So would they even be interested in pursuing it at, at all from a court, from a legal perspective, because uh, they can't do anything with it, as is item 57. Both of those would be inadmissible in a court case. Why, why well, you, are you, sh you sure about that? I mean, they, they can just, you know, other evidence it can be re revisited. You know, but the, since they were both found um, and not um, at, the house had been entered by other people, um, they would have been tampered the with. The scene had been yeah released, and you've got all these other people coming out mm -hmm. in and out. There's no way to prove at that point that those mm -hmm. were there and part of the, the original crime scene. So I would I, I agree with Dan that I think it would be really easy to have that tossed out both of them fifty three and fifty sure yeah defense you know defense would definitely try to toss it out I'm just not sure how the judge would rule on that um but you know especially if it did have some other if it did have confirmed Camille's blood on there or Rania's or somebody else's blood attached to the house they could probably move it up a little bit just based that they have evidence of victims' blood on that you know and who touched it after that they could they can go ahead and they can dis, they can disqualify the workers and such and get, you know, check their DNA and prints and such, but other people could have been in there they don't know about either. I, I mean, I do agree with you on that part, but, um, yeah, maybe if they found something, they should try to get it, you know, entered into evidence if it would help. I mean, wouldn't that be new found, something that's new found if, if they don't, if there's nothing else on this? I mean, even though it's in these documents here, um, isn't this something that maybe they don't even know about? Well, we've pre we presented some of this new evidence already, I think, to the Apple Valley and uh, the items that Catherine and Michelle uh, sent over to the Attorney General as well. So they're aware of the new information, are they not? Yes, I sent them. I mean, it, it, a lot of stuff. I don't. I did not mention fifty item fifty three though, okay, but exactly. I did send them a lot of other stuff, and it has been crickets. Hmm. And, maybe, and maybe. the private investigator that was hired, uh, Kenneth Maines, didn't come across this either. It didn't, you know, didn't didn't stick in his craw after reading this, mm -hmm. as worth mentioning at all. Yeah. Well, is it is it worth Catherine maybe reaching back out to them and you know, mentioning item fifty three? Did did you did you include item forty one and the the missing DNA profiles there? I'd have to go back and check. Um, on on those other particular items, but I would be more than willing to do it and and even revisit item 41. I I don't remember if I included that. I know I really focused on the uh, multiple blunt force trauma, 
-hmm. because that, I mean, yes, there's photos of it, but that was not mentioned anywhere. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll re redo an email and do a follow up and then add this new stuff. If, if it, do you guys think that's a good idea? Stephen, is that something we should do now or should we wait? I don't know. Maybe we should we should Monday, Monday morning quarterback this before we you know before we get any doors you know maybe shut up or show show our show our hand. Maybe we just got maybe basically write a report up and try to get an attorney involved. And I suggest that to help get us you know more documents and records. Okay. I like that. I like that. Well, I've got some notes here because um, I was going over the BCA 40-page document here that I've got pulled up and um, just trying to find little things, anything that I could find on item 53 and um, things that I didn't include in the book either. So I was a little uh, frustrated with myself today as I'm going through some of these items here to see what uh, why why I felt the need to either leave this out or maybe it just, you know, it just wasn't that relevant. But looking at this stuff, um, obviously we know item 53 is not part of the uh, lab analysis request here. If you look at page one of this 40-page document, uh, which you can find on my website, and I think, Dan, uh, I know you can find it in the in the group documents too, um, and you may be able to find it on uglytruth.info, um, Dan Hinnon's website too. But you can see this ends at item 48. Um, so page page four of four. So these are four pages. These are all of the items that are uh, going to be looked at by the the Minnesota BCA. Speaking of that, does the Minnesota BCA have any uh, authority to reinvestigate to investigate period or are they just simply data collecting documenting showing say hey this is what we found and that's it I mean is there any would they be of any any help um, to try to get the case reopened or is that kind of a lost cause I think it, it, it could be but but that's the group that's got the uh, inconsistencies with the metadata on the photographs. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be hesitant on doing anything, I think. I see. Well, this, four, this uh, first, um, the first four pages, this is signed off by Joe Cooksley on 1-18-2015. The, uh, a big thing to note here, I'm going to go back up to page one, actually. Um, the estimated due date, if you look at the estimated due date, um, these are some interesting dates that we do have here. So there's not much time. They're giving it a couple months for most of these things here, but there's not much time for them to find these extra bullets. And because um, once they figure out, you know, let's let's say that they didn't have item 53 or item 57, they would only have bullets tied to David's wife. That's it. So it's really odd that all of a sudden, a few days later, they find a magic bullet rolls out of this carpet. One month later, they find a magic bullet in this attic. Um, they needed to find those. Whether they were just, you know, whatever the case is, I'm glad that they did find them. And I'm glad that they actually documented them. But in this 40-page document that we're looking at here, it's 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 really brushed over, especially item 53. I would even argue item 53 is mentioned less than item 57, and we're going to go through some of that here too. So, um, uh, so yeah, so this so the first one, only 48 items. That's all that they had when they left that crime scene. Uh, then they have this other analysis request form that is not dated. This is three pages long here, filled out by Detective Bone. And they found other items. When they said, this, is this a new case, they put no, which is accurate because it's not. This is where they find item 53. The only thing they're going to test for is the nuclear DNA. 
scrolling down just a little bit here known DNA samples I want to talk about the known DNA samples because they put yes and they put no so they've checkmarked yes and they've checkmarked no and we're going to see later on that they have DNA samples for all three people maybe it's a typo possibly that would, that's the only logical thing that I can make sense of but in the comments here and again this is not dated so you wouldn't really know that they're talking about item 53 you wouldn't know that they're talking about item 57 based on the order of these documents in these 40 pages I can only guess that they're talking about item 53 so this is a possible murder suicide I am submitting a found bullet from the scene after the BCA crime scene team left this scene test for DNA if possible questions call me and that's from Brian bone that is to Joe Joe Cooksley very short very brief I mean I, there's just really not much here so is Joe Cooksley out of the loop here too and he says okay test for the for any DNA doesn't say what date that they found it this document here um, is not dated this three-page document is not dated um, then we go down to page eight here and this is where the nuclear DNA tests are going to be done here. This shows everything that they have tested as of 2-3-2015. Obviously, item 57 is not going to be included on this. Um, but whereas there were 48 items previously, and this is a four-page document, you know, now we're getting into items. Um, there are 53 items. Item 50, 51, and 52 are known DNA or are known blood samples from David Kamel and from uh, Rania where did these DNA samples come from are these DNA samples from the bodies at the crime yeah. scene they are they took them when they did the autopsy they took known blood they took blood samples from the crime from scene. the bodies from the during the autopsy I got you okay because I mean, um, why weren't those included in the in the first forty eight? In the first document, the first forty eight doc. Because or, uh, they hadn't item. completed, they hadn't done the autopsies yet. Gotcha. So they were still working on that. Mhm. Mm and once they got that, they just happened to also get item fifty three at that same time, around that same time. Um, now here's the main thing here looking at page 10 one area of item 53 that's where they found blood so this says presumptive testing indicated the presence of blood on the following one area of 53 the presence of blood is in one area now the way that I would read that would be that okay there's one blood source so how do you have two DNAs how do you have two people here on one area this is what they looked at this is what they tested item 53 was tested for blood the way that I'm reading these documents if I'm if I'm wrong I'd love to be shown that um, if you guys know of, you know of anywhere here I can't find anywhere else when they say that they swab 53 I can't find that they swab anything else but this one area and this is why I really would like to understand how they swabbed item 53 and what this unknown DNA was it was it touch DNA was it skin cells was it saliva was it what was it actual blood because this is going to help us try to understand item 57 when we finally get to it mm -hmm. okay well what I find interesting about um, that part in the report right there where it says that they found blood on one spot now mm -hmm. if <laughs> you have a projectile going through a skull it should be all over not just in one area 
and and again that that fragment looks really clean so that's my question and for because um, since we don't know and we can't see the quote-unquote area of blood that that was found um, could it been a drop of blood that had been mixed who knows prior maybe somebody picked it up again we just we just don't know there's not enough information um, it's very vague right that's probably why I didn't put a lot of that in in my book because it was, you know, what do we know? What can we prove? What did they find? What is conclusive? A, a lot of that I really tried to stick to that. So that's probably why I barely mentioned item 53-2, which we can see here on uh, page 12. Hey, look, there's 53-2. Apparent hairs and fibers were collected. <laughs> so <laughs> That's where I got it. I knew I got it from yes. somewhere. <laughs> Well, um, <laughs> when a hollow point mushrooms, it does it mushroom once it makes impact with with the body or the skull or a wall. Even does it impact at that time? Or, I mean, does it mushroom at that time, or how does that upon, work? Upon, because upon, mm -hmm. upon contact with the surface, it'll mushroom. Depending okay. on how hard the surface is. So if it went through Rania's skull, then it should have mushroomed by the time it exited? Correct. So it should be covered in her DNA, the entire bone, correct? correct? And they only much, found yeah. blood in one spot. Yep, that that's my point. And it, <laughs> it, so it should have had tissue, it should have had hair. Yep. Yeah. A lot of it. But it didn't. Nope. Brain matter, everything. It, yep. Hmm. So does, does that help us maybe see close no. range, far range? Oh, this is another rabbit hole. <laughs> what if it's, uh, you know, it, it just... Say that you know the wing it's winged or just barely touched your skin and just drew a little blood, and then when it went from maybe just barely touching her skin, I mean, it should be more blood if it entered entered any part of the body. But in the, it would mushroom if it hit the floor or the carpet. Um, it should be a lot more blood if it entered her body, though. That's for sure. And they didn't find any stippling for Rania at all, so this was not an up close and personal. Well, this is where the the idea, at least in my perspective, and oh, oh, we have, we have Stephen here um, because reading her autopsy report, it does state. Oh, where is her autopsy report? I, I brought it up here. Um, it states the wound is surrounded by an approximately 0 0.5 centimeter wide faint circular impression. No evidence of soot, stippling, or unburned gunpowder particles is on the skin or bone surrounding the wound. Now, could that have been a silencer? Or, or, or what? I mean, we know it's surrounding the entrance wound, this the circular faint impression, but they don't find stippling or soot. Could that have been caused by um, a silencer? Hmm. You're, you're still going to get um, powder out of the barrel, okay. even with the silencer. So some, it still has to exit following the bullet. So Okay, so do you have powder. any... Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. sorry. I was going to say, do you have any idea what that faint circular impression could have been? Yeah, they, put the, they may have put the barrel to her, against her head. Okay. But there should be stippling, correct? If they put it pressed it right against her head, maybe not, because it's, I'm talking right against the skin. All that stippling is just going to go inside. It wouldn't be tat tattooing or stippling on the outside. And if, she, and if her hair was down along that area, too, that, that the hair would have absolved some of the stippling, I believe. Not all of it, maybe a little bit. But the, 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 round, the round circular, if it's fairly consistent and, and accurate, would be the barrel of the weapon, possibly. Okay. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. 
Thank you for explaining that because we've we've been wondering about this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, so we know they have um they still have that blood. They've retained uh the sample of David, Kamel and Rania in their entirety. So that's good. Um what else did I have here? I had a few other notes. Uh, uh, see if I have any more. Just to end this off here. Uh, let's see, I have page 14. So page 14. So finally, here on page 14, um, this is where you, you can see they have now included item 54, 55, 56, and 57. So this is everything here. Um, what I find disturbing here is if we scroll down to the circumstances, uh, we're looking at page 14 of page 40 of the BCA lab analysis results here. Um, in the circumstances, they are sure to mention item 57 that they found on 2-18-2015, no mention of item 53, nothing. They go down here to the date and time processed. Again, they mention uh, 117 2015 to 118 2015. They give you the exact times of the processing. Nothing on item 53. They skip down to item 57 218 2015. They give you the times of those dates. Item 53 is completely out of this so far. That bothers me too. Why? If they're going to mention item 57, why don't they mention item 53 here? Yeah. It's a big That's problem. A point. It's a big problem that we have here. Um, I don't understand that. I really don't. Um, they're very careful to mention a lot of other things, to mention every person that's looking at this, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it just seems like some of these documents were filled out and then they were added on. So where we see in the circumstances, um, it just looks like from where it says on 2018, 2015, that was added later from the, the date slash time process from 1745 hours to 1945 hours on 218 2015 it looks like that was added later why didn't they add they had time to add that why didn't they add anything about item 53 i, I don't understand that i don't understand that reasoning um even looking at page 15 they have the location the items there's no item 53 here it's mentioned later on yes but it's not here I don't understand this. I don't understand. It just makes me think that item item 53, maybe I'm, I always thought item item 57 was the smoking gun. <laughs> maybe item 53 is, is more I think that they gun. actually both are. Yeah. In my opinion. Maybe we should make this part of the conference call. <laughs> yeah, I think so. These two. I think so, which I do hope to do hope to get that set up here pretty soon too. Um, what else did I have here? Oh, the circumstances. Let me go back to the circumstances. Um, Sophia, we had talked a little bit about this too. The, the circumstances for what they say. Um, let me read this here. They say that the investigative information revealed that the occupants of the home had not been in contact with anyone for weeks. That's not true. That is completely not true. So either they don't know what they're talking about or they are lying. It can only be one of the two. Um, so, Fia, can you kind of maybe um, explain a little bit, bit about what, what you relayed to me earlier today about that? Well, uh, we have a conversation between Kamel and her friend uh, via text message, and that occurred on the 21st of December. Well, Kamel replied in the morning of the 21st of December. 
Mm-hmm. And then um, we have David, who uh, he was going back and forth with Danny August Mason, and I believe the last time that he contacted him, I, I have to look at my messages that I sent you. Okay. Was one second here. Uh, Maybe the six December sixteenth. December ninth. Well, it was December ninth uh, that he last emailed Danny August Mason. Uh, he emailed Jason Allen on December seventeenth, and then um, sorry for the thumbs up, Greg. That's okay. <laughs> I was trying to scroll down, and then supposedly we have the text message to Chris Peck about the pot, but we haven't seen any proof of that, and we don't see any proof on his. Uh, telephone reports saying that he sent out any text messages. So, but they made sure to include the emails and they made sure to include Camille's text stream to our friends. So, and and you didn't, think that didn't David go to Smashburger um, sometime around then too in December? Yes, there was. December twenty first. Okay. Well, he had to sp- he had to speak with somebody there, so it's not like there's no communication. But weeks is the main thing here because they're saying weeks. If they're saying that these people, all three of them, died on uh, December twenty sixth, you've just given us three or four different dates, three or four different people here that spoke with him well within one week. So we're not talking about weeks here. But that's what we were led to to think, that this was three three weeks, more than three weeks, it had to been four or five weeks, that nobody had talked with him. That's not true. We know that Sean Wright had also talked with, with David Crowley, too, if we're to believe Sean Wright, which he is not a credible source, but just based on what he says, he's one of the last people to have ever talked with, with David. That was in... I've seen no the, proof of that. I mean, I'm just saying what, what he says, right? Mm-hmm. So if he was one of the last people to talk with David and Hendrix um, also said, you know, because I questioned him uh, about that too, and he said Sean was one of the last people to talk with them, um, that uh, that was around December 16th, somewhere around that area. Right, Dan? Do you remember um, any verification on that? Or did Sean write? I know he said he was David's uh, the Rolodex, <laughs> personal <laughs> Rolodex, personal Rolodex, whatever the hell that that means. But um, I mean, if he's talking to David there on the 16th, obviously that's not weeks. You know, that's uh, I mean, that's 10 days. So. Um, it's just you know, and you have David. They they pick up their daughter on the on the nineteenth. So uh, this communication, no one has been in communication with them. It's just one little sentence, but it's you know where where are they getting this stuff from? Why are they writing this things like this? It's just it's very frustrating. Uh, and I took it. <laughs> I took it to mean something completely different. Oh gosh, sometimes oh, I swear I'm an alien. Um, <laughs> when when it says that they haven't been in contact with anyone for weeks and that a dog was active within the house, I took that and I understood that to mean that weeks from the time that the bodies were found. But see, to me, that means weeks being two. So that means that somewhere around January 1st, somebody had to have had contact with them which means that they weren't dead at Christmas time. So that's where my brain went with it. Oh, I see. Well, they I mean, they say because there was no activity past December 26th, they, they think that that's the date that everybody was, was dead. Oh, oh, right. But, and that's where um, I think we, uh, we as a group um, can state that the lack of consistency within their time frame is is like appalling um, because when 
for me, the, the, the key part of that sentence isn't just the weeks, but that the dog was active within the house. Oh, no, wait, since that the dog was active in the house upon arrival. So you're correct. So I, I could have obviously just read that wrong, but for me, it still states that either they're saying that um, they're inadvertently stating that there was contact somewhere around the 1st of January with this family, or they're saying that there was no contact with that family, like how you understood it, um, weeks before the 21st. So right. what is it? It's a month and a half. You know, there's a huge month, a month, month and a half time frame that they are leaving it completely wide open to anyone's interpretation. There's nothing is concise. Nothing is is explained. Yeah, yeah. This investigative information uh, says you know that they didn't make contact with anybody weeks. Uh, I I definitely took that to mean. Uh, De December 26, giving them the giving them the benefit of the doubt. I I kind of even think maybe it, that it's possible that they were dead well before that date too. But let's just say that it's December 26. Everybody's dead. Obviously, if it's in January, we you know <laughs> that makes sense for that they haven't been in contact with anybody for weeks because they were dead for a couple weeks <laughs> between. <the time. laughs> but. If we go by their logic, by what they're saying, by the December twenty twenty six, we we know that they were that David's wife was in contact with somebody on December twenty first. That's days. That's not weeks. And then we we you know we got the other people that they were also in in contact with too. Now I have to remember too. By this point, they don't have. I have to go back and make sure they don't have the phone records that show that you know no, no they had their call there hadn't been any calls made until uh, what was it November Sophia is that right David for David it was after Thanksgiving in November right right so that's that's a whole other issue there so it's not it's not uh, like it's a big deal. For me, because obviously they're not, in, you know, they're not calling people. Um, he's online chatting. He's online doing things. He's sending messages to people online. He's meeting with people. He's picking up his daughter. He's going to Smashburger. He's doing okay. things. Okay. We actually don't know that David was the one who went to Smashburger. Somebody could have taken his card. Kamel could have even used his card. True. We're just assuming that it was David who went to Smashburger. Somebody went to Smashburger with <laughs> with mm -hmm. their car. Definitely. Correct. Someone his his card was charged on December twenty first for thirty some dollars of purchases at Smashburger in Apple Valley. Mm -hmm. We don't know who physically went there and got what. Dan, have you ever eaten at Smashburger? No. Um, okay, I'm just trying to figure out, would $20 be for two people? Or uh, one? It, it was 30 and I would, and I was, and I would oh. say that's kind of high. And so that would be a group, of, a group of people. And that's what, you know, people have suspected that it wasn't David and his family at all. It was a bunch of guys ordering burgers. Uh, with David's okay. card. So. Well, the reason why I asked was because if we go to like five guys here, just my daughter and I, it's, it's like $25, $26. And that's just usually two drinks, two burgers, and a fry. Oh, okay, okay. So that's, that's so, Texas. That's your Texas prices there. <laughs> <laughs> So that's why I was kind of wondering it was it, if it was one person eating or are they pretty affordable? <laughs> I, I was just trying to see if it was how many people would have gone to eat there. I'm but, guessing that was a meal for, for, for two to two to three people. Okay. Okay. Then that makes sense. 
Now, um, so we're looking at the 21st uh, mm -hmm. for last known activity. Okay. Besides David's little note <laughs> saying six days until the first or something. The the meme note. Was that six days till Christmas, or was that six days till New Year? I forget. Yeah, I know. To the New Year. To, to the New Year. Okay. Which looks like it was a five change to to six. By the way. <clears throat> so. It's pretty interesting too. That might line up with their. With their timeline. And I be believe the last phone call that Kamel or David, because it could have been either. Uh, made was to Wells Fargo, and that was to, um, this is my guess, my best guess, transfer money over for the house payment to be made, because that was the one thing that bounced. The house payment bounced? It did in December, and then money was transferred over, and it went through. That's interesting. No, no was, other bounces that we know of. Mm -mm. No. Usually David was really good about transferring money over. And that month, I guess it was forgotten. Because both he and Camille made their own transfers to that account mm -hmm. from their other accounts. That's weird. And I'm assuming that Camille made the call because it was her phone and the money supposedly came from her account. Well, I got um, page 21 pulled up here. And uh, this is where I had assumed we would see item 53. It's not here. Um I haven't. I need to go back and look at all of the other diagrams because there are several of them. So, but th this one is the one that's in their 40-page document. This is the the uh, official one here. So, if if item 53 is going to be in any of the diagrams, it should be here. Now, I need to go back and see if it's in if it's in the ones the the drawn diagrams. It might be there. I'm not 100% sure, but looking at this, um, if, I'm just going to, with my cursor, I'm going to show where item 53 was, and this is where item 53 should have been found, and as you can see, there's no item 53 there. There's item 57, so if they didn't include item 57, I, I would say, okay, well, that makes sense, but the fact that they include item 57 and not item 53 frustrates me. Why would you You're not right, include that one? And, and just to, like, I just want to piggyback off what Greg is saying about this page 21 of 40. It's, I think it's pretty important. Okay, so I was looking over um, some of the reports on the bullets while you guys were talking. There are three bullets with white substances on them. Hmm. Uh, one is item 45, which is the bullet that went in the south wall. One is mm -hmm. item 53. And then the other bullet was item 57. So the bullets with white substances had contact with the wall or ceiling. And then if you read the page 21 out of 40 that Greg is referring to, it says in here, um, a hole was observed in the south wall of the open area. This is item 45. Chemical testing of the area around the hole failed to detect the presence of lead. However, a bullet, item 45, was retrieved from inside of the wall near the hole. Additional holes were also observed on a removable ceiling tile and the wood ceiling above the tile near the hole in the wall. On the other side of the wood ceiling was the wood floor from the living room underneath the area rug. Holes were observed in both the area rug and the wood floor underneath the rug. Chemical testing of the hole in the wood floor also failed to detect the presence of light. So that 
item 53 could be very well connected, um, as Greg was saying. I think it's connected maybe to item 45, something similar. 45, because they're seeing holes in the rug, and on the other side of this wall is the area rug where item 53 was eventually found. That's true. Yeah, so item 45. And item? item 45 had white substance on the bullet, as did item 53. Wait, they don't put item 45 on here either? I think 45 is on the next one where it shows the, the bottom half of the house. Oh, <clears throat> but, okay. you know, it to me it would always make sense because it looked like they shot into the floor. through it, You know, so they're, they're aiming the gun toward the floor. Um, and, of course, we've got that rug. So it goes through the rug. It then goes through the floor, which then goes through the, the acoustic tile, which then enters into the wall. So if, you know that trajectory makes sense. So since it ends up in the wall, it's going to have the white powdery substance on it. At 57, it supposedly goes through the ceiling. Well, it does. It goes through the ceiling, so that makes sense, white powdery substance. But number 53, and they're saying that that's suppo it's supposed to be connected to Rania, and it goes through a, you know, the, the head, and it has white powder on it? Really? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. No. I mean, it kind of lines up. This defect here, the defect in the in the floor, it kind of lines up with where Rania is, but that shows where the killer would have to be standing. Um, I don't know. That's Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and since they didn't do either a rod test or a laser test or a string or, you know, thing, we have no idea really the trajectory. All we know is that they're saying, you know, there's a hole through the rug, which then matches up with the hole in the floor, which then, you know, leads you to, to this other path. And uh, well, I, I mean, I'm so frustrated with him. I know. Me too. I mean, I'm sure everybody listening to this is. And we just, you know, we're not... We're just trying to figure out what really happened here. That's the yeah. most Im important thing. Um, but, uh, Stephen, I mean, wouldn't you think that the police would, um, I mean, once they know that there is item 53, wouldn't they want to get more of the details to say, okay, this person was standing here, this person was standing there, find out more about where exactly these people were when the rug when, when the bullet rolled out of this rug to kind of help them understand uh something to where they would know you know to get some type of area of see where the where item 50 53 uh was really found on this rug we don't have any documentation we don't have any police reports saying that okay i spoke with both of, of the guys who lifted up that rug, this guy was standing here, the second guy was standing there, they watched it roll out, you know, and it rolled out here. It's, everything's just very vague when it comes to item 53. Shouldn't there be more? Yeah, I mean, we, we, I mean, we talked about it possibly, you know, these things being placed in there after the fact. I mean, you know, it, you know, you got the spent casing and you don't have a bolt and then you got two bullets. And then you had a, 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 round, a live round on the floor at one time. It just doesn't make sense. Um, it, they, they, they could have went back in there and, and, and you know, reinvestigated that. You know, like you said, sp speak to the people that found the, the bullet. You know, it's, it's, there's marks on the floor, the carpet. They could, they, could, they could certainly probably line the carpet back up with the hole and any kind of damage to the floor underneath it. That wouldn't be very difficult. And maybe trace that back. To, um, where the you know uh, caliber was ignited, or, you know, was shot from. Should there be a supplemental report of sure, you know, yeah. going through that and saying? Yeah, I mean, abs no, abs absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, just case case cases closed can be reopened any time. I mean, there's no statute of limitations on homicide if we can prove that. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that the, whole, that the whole thing with the bullet, really, that's why I was confused in the beginning. I, I didn't read my notes, I apologize, but, um, that the, you know, 53 doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Um, but here on page 20, 22, 
uh, they finally do mention item 53. They, you know, they have 50 through 53. Um, who it was submitted by, not who it was found by, which is different than the other items. But that's okay. At least they're they're talking about it now. It's in the conversation. Um, item 53 is included in the nuclear DNA section, and it's also included in the firearms section. So uh, this is um, this is that's the 11-page document there. So, I mean, any anyone, any supervisor, any people, you know. People that are reading that, any news reporters, fake news reporters that have access to all of, of this stuff, if they're not looking for anything, if they're just reading it, you know, they're not going to read that much into it because item 53 is not mentioned much. But to a journalist, to people who really care about what happened here, to people who understand what item 53 is, it's a big deal that it's it's just glossed over. Uh, glossed over more than item 57 from what I can see here. Um, I find it interesting here, page 23 is just the item 52, which is Rania's blood sample. So it isn't like, you know, um, uh, 50 and 51, which is David and David's wife. That's their blood sample. It's just weird that we have this one document here dated 3-16-2015 that only mentions one item, item 52. I'm not sh not sure what's going on there. Uh, it just looks like a lot of backtracking here that they're kind of saying, okay, item 52 is a single source composite DNA profile indicated as a female was obtained by comparison to other samples in this case. So when we say, when, when I ask where did Rania's DNA come from, the reason why I don't believe it came from her autopsy is because they never confirmed Rania's autopsy. They never confirmed that that was her body. It's circumstantial. So that's, that's a big deal. Now, maybe I got that wrong, and if I got that wrong, I hope somebody will help me understand because I want to get it right you know um, whatever whatever the truth is I want to make sure that I get it right but the way no that you are you're correct they never actually confirmed her they just so if they threw can't... that but the blood sample did come from the body that was in the autopsy okay from... so they're, they're wording this in a certain way here I mean it's like they have this Item 52, they don't even mention Rania's name here. Um, I mean, they, they do at the, at the top, that, you know, it's a blood, known blood sample of Rania, but the results of the DNA profiling with an asterisk ne next to it um, was performed on item 52 and the DNA results, it's a single source composite DNA profile. So they're testing her body and they just are kind of assuming that it's her or I'm a little confused by this and I'm sure people that understand this terminology know exactly what they're talking about but but I don't <laughs> obviously well I do have a question for Stephen in regards to this do they normally just take blood from the bodies even though they haven't been positively ID'd and do DNA tests from that against items found at a crime scene? Or would they take, like, known toothbrushes and hairbrushes and use that DNA? They would use it all. I mean, if you don't have an ID in the body, you'll John Doe that one, John Doe, Jane Doe, and um, try to match everything up under the John or Jane Doe until they identify the bodies. But they'll collect the evidence and mark it best they can. And the toothbrushes and such like that, definitely they would collect them separately and then and, and match the DNA up with any kind of blood DNA or anything else. But they'll, they'll John and, and uh, Jane Doe the bodies, but they'll still collect everything. Interesting. And we don't see that at this crime scene. They didn't take those items. I know, it's unbelievable. They I mean, they, they've, they've, anything that goes in your mouth, I mean, they, you know, it, 
even even silverware that's not washed, maybe laying on the counter. I mean, anything. Yeah, and see, this is where it spit out This is this opens up the conspiracy wormhole because, and I'm saying wormhole because it sucks everybody in at this point. Uh, these bodies, it, it leaves it open for debate that these bodies could be other people that they are trying to pass off as David, Kamel, and Rania. Now, I'm not behind this 100%, uh, this theory, but I'm trying to describe it in the best way that I can. The way that they they took the blood samples from the bodies and the autopsy, and then they matched it up to the items that were found at the home. So if David and Camille and Rania were faking their deaths and they had these corpses uh, that they took possession of and had them there in the house as them, quotation marks, and then nothing was nothing else at that scene was tested with uh, for their DNA. Oh, I'm not making this clear. I, I know where you're going with this. Um, you're thinking yeah. that that's not the family, and maybe they're somewhere else, or they. What are you? Well, I mean, I'm not behind that theory 100 percent. But there are some people who have said that this is a false flag and that they're actually mm-hmm. alive and that these people or the bodies that were found there were passed off as them. And so I'm just trying to find, uh, trying to, well, besides making a mess of explaining this, uh, it, it's just, the way that they word things in this paperwork, it's just not a hundred percent. It's not cut and dry. Okay, item fifty two was Ronnie's blood. She's been identified a hundred percent positive and hundred percent ID'd. And so it maybe just it's, maybe it's maybe it's just not David there. Maybe it's Ronya and Kamel and David it's not David. He had a lot of damage to his head. Um, I mean, we. we, well, we didn't, I mean, what? I mean, not true. But you don't find David's DNA all over the crime scene either. Right. I mean, I mean out of all the things you would think that it would be on the computer, it would be on the wall at least. Mm-hmm. But you're not finding it there. You're finding Kamel's DNA. Or at least exactly. the DNA belonging to to the body that's supposed to be Camille's. So. Well, it's like, you know, you also mentioned maybe that the bodies may have, I mean, people thought maybe they, they were killed elsewhere, which I'm not certain about. But mm-hmm. if David had knowledge of some things, maybe classified, I don't know, maybe they pulled him out of the, away from the family and, you know, maybe they substituted him with some. I mean, that's maybe getting at a little bit on that. Um, maybe he's, he, was, he was valuable for information before they killed him, or he's not in there and they killed him. He's somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah. I I, I do agree. This is I, I, it's it's lousy, shoddy police work, but there's more to it than that. There's too many things, too many, and this is a this is a, you know three three dead bodies, a triple homicide as we look at it. And, you know, um, and everything's a homicide in the beginning. They, um, wow. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a cover up. I mean, it, there's, there's just no doubt. I mean, it's, it's a cover up. I mean, do, just, you know. do they always start when they, when police walk into these crime scenes? Are they trained to think, you know, um, this is a double murder suicide? I mean. Uh, I've always had that that issue of why they, how they came to that conclusion so quickly, so quickly. Well, it was from the very start. 
It was but from, they, right, from yeah. the very first 911 call. Th- that's where it starts, and it never really... It never really changes from that, even though we have we've gone through all of this all of these documents, all of this stuff that doesn't show I, you know, I, oh I'm sorry, I never listened to that nine one one call brief me real quickly did they say did the, the caller say it looked like a a murder suicide is that what the caller yeah, said is that what you're getting one at? of the very first things Whoa, really That's I didn't know that, oh my God, yeah, so it's yeah. you know it's a murder or so, a a suicide, suicide. Yeah. but it, but if it's a suicide, it wouldn't it be? I mean, there's three bodies there, so why would you say a murder or a suicide? Be a murder, murders mm-hmm. or suicides? It's I don't know. It's just it's, I, I, if I looked through that window, I would have thought homicide, three murders. So I wouldn't have thought suicide. Not you know, not even close. Just from you know, if the guy looks peek through the window, and there's no way. I mean, right I, here I, it's like. Uh, yeah. She's like, ah, yes, this is Judy Pucknow. I live at uh, Ramsdale Drive. I'm leaving out her her address. Uh, the 911 operator says yes. And Judy then told the dispatch, I think there has been a murder or suicide next door. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's jumping early. It's pretty early. Yeah, it's real, especially for somebody who isn't trained or anything. I mean, it's, I mean, even myself, as a former officer, if I peeked through the window, I wouldn't have thought suicide. I mean, there's just three bodies. It's, to me, it looks like I call them call them murder until proven otherwise. You know. Yeah, and that's you know that's just some some neighbor. Um, but what do the police find? What what do they find to say? Oh yeah, this looks like a murder or a suicide. A murder and a suicide. You know, um, there's there's nothing there. We've we've gone. Well, they, 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 Go ahead. Dude, the, the, the police department was familiar, or at least officers were familiar with David prior to this. Yes, they had been called. Yes. Yeah. Right. Did they know? Did they were they aware that you know he was doing the, the deep state stuff or anything else? I mean. They had they had friendly friendly talks with with David. Um, from what I hear, some of the cops, because back in sep- September of 2014, David had a garage sale and he was selling mm-hmm. some military stuff. You know, movie movie prop stuff basically. Right. And so one of the neighbors called the cops, and so the cops showed up, and I guess some of the cops actually ended up buying some of those props. <laughs> so, <laughs> You know, there was nothing. There was nothing bad there. There was a neighbor, um, a young kid, and maybe maybe Anne or Dan or, or Sophia or Catherine know more about this. Uh, um, it's a, it's a video that we we don't talk that much about, but we, we probably should. There was a young kid who um, you know talked about David and said that you know he did not think that David had committed this this crime and Judy Proc now called him autistic and was basically putting this kid down and it's like it's just really weird really weird stuff like that um mm-hmm. the the actions of so many people you know who claim to be David's friends or David's neighbors and stuff like that it's just it's just really odd the way that they acted but um even if we discount the- all of that go ahead well, it's it's also how they're still acting is because if you're on Reddit or Instagram or anything and you talk about this case, boom, she pops up and she tries to control the narrative immediately. It is the freakiest stuff ever, and that's why we try not to say her name because it, it's, oh, it's like a you. moth to a flame. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And then you, I, it goes from her trying to control the situation to then attacking. Yeah, which she and, has, has no no facts to back any of this stuff up. Is not looking at any of the stuff. Will not debate any of these factual documents. The actual document. I don't know if she's even read them. You know, she only spoke with David once, twice maybe. Um, she I mean, she even admits that she didn't even know him. 
Yeah, no, she doesn't know anything. She's almost, I mean, the only relevance, from my view, the only relevance she has to this case is this call, the 911 call, and the fact that the Gray State goons have taken advantage of, of her, talked bad uh, about her, and pretty much have tricked her into whatever whatever she thinks is really going going on but i mean though she's some she's one of the people that thinks that there was a pack theory that david and his wife um had this pack to kill themselves and to kill their daughter at the same time she'll say that the official theory is right you can't have it both ways the official theory states that this was a double murder suicide if there was a pact that is a double suicide and a murder. So even that logic, just it's just that's why people should not even take her seriously. Just and the crazy that. thing is, she sits there and spouts all this crazy stuff about David, and then she had allowed her grandchildren to play over there. Yeah, it's it's completely unsupervised funny. by her. I mean. It, it, that's it's just crazy. If he was somebody who was so unstable and stuff like that, why are you letting your grandchildren play over there? Yeah, it's ridiculous. So, or or not even know him or speak with him, but you're allowing your grandchildren to go over there. That's that's crazy. I mean. <laughs> Allow them to play in the backyard where you could see them and you can see what's going on. Or at least go over there and strike up a conversation and get to know that person before you allow your grandchildren or anybody to go into that house that's part of your family. I mean, if I'm, I totally would not have ever allowed anything like that to happen no, that's, that's ridiculous. without knowing the person. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Um, okay, page 31. Let's go to page 31 here. 31. Okay, so 31. These are the results of the firearm. Because I was trying to see, okay, they say David's gun fired item 53. So let's see what they have. What evidence do they have? Now, in the BCA 488 document, you'll find probably a lot, a lot of more of the actual details of this here. But just looking at what they have, what they finalized, based on everything that they find, et cetera, et cetera, this is what they say. They say that item, item 1 did fire um, item 50, 53. So, okay, so that's great. Based on what? That's where it gets a little tricky here because they have a hard time. I know we're going to talk about item 57 on another show, but they have a hard time connecting item 57 to that gun. And they use item 31, which is a bullet fragment, which is completely weird too. Um, but they don't really explain how do they prove that item 1 fired item 53? The only thing that they mention is that when they looked at item 53 and these other bullets, tier 2, um, that they show them to be consistent with bullets from a Winchester PDX-1 brand cartridge. Okay, how does any of that prove that item 1, which is the gun, fired item 53, the bullet that we're talking about here. I'm not seeing it. Are you guys seeing anything? What would you... Let me ask wait, you this. Wait, wait, wait. What would you um, need to to see in order to prove that um, item 53 was fired from David's gun? What should I look for? Wait. Items test fired cartridge from item one were entered into Minnesota Firearms Database. Search failed to reveal any items matched item one. If future searches of the database. 
Yeah, I was I was interested. Maybe you can read that, and we can get Stephen's view on that. If you want to read that sentence or that paragraph there, I, 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 I didn't understand. I'm I'm reading it off of the phone, but I'm having a hard time seeing it. Yeah, it's it's. Okay. I was baffled by that one too. Um, Items the, of a test fire cartridge case mm-hmm. from item one were entered into the Minnesota Firearms di- uh, database. A search of the database failed to reveal any items that matched item one. Right. And so the, my guess is if it was fired in any other crimes. Crime. Right. That's what it is. It's, it was used in other crimes. Gotcha. Correct. And then it says at, at the very top, item one, Springfield Armory X D forty. Yada, yada, yada. Fired items 2, 3, 9, 30, 36, and 37. Parentheses 6, 40 caliber cartridges. And items 42, 43, 44, 45, 53, and 57, 6 bullets. Based on what? Yeah, they were... Okay, they were matching the cartridges and the bullets that were found at the scene. Right. But how did they prove I mean, look at how much time would they spend time to to try to connect item fifty seven to item one. They have to use item thirty one in order to, to do that. So what do they use to connect item one to item forty two, forty three, forty four, forty five and forty three and and fifty three? It's not here. Is it in the large BCA report, the information of how they matched these bullets up? It, that would have to be, yeah. In the BCA 488, they would have th- those images would have to be there to show, okay, well, we, we match this because if you shoot a gun from, if you shoot a bullet out of this gun, uh, these markings should be there. So that's what we should look for then, I guess. That second to last paragraph where it said images of a test fire cartridge, I'm guessing that they took this test fire cartridge and matched the rifling marks against all the ones that were up in this first paragraph. But if they did that, they wouldn't need that. They wouldn't need item 31 to match item I know. 57. That's a whole other issue. I know <laughs> that's yeah. a whole other thing. Um, just trying to stick to item 53. So what what we should find, and we'll go through the, uh, later on we'll go through the BCA 488, and uh, maybe we'll come back at a separate time and try to figure out, um, okay, well, this is how they were able to take these test bullets, the cartridges that were fired, the bullets that were fired from item 1, and we should find evidence that they matched it to 42, 43, 44, 45, and 53. So those images should be in the BCA 488 document. So I'll make sure I'm going to make a note here to try to go through those. Um, just looking at some final thoughts here, unless anybody has any final thoughts. I hope I'm glad you're all still with me. I'm sorry for making this so late. I do apologize for that. Um, but I'd like to get some final thoughts from everybody just regarding item 53. Um, I don't think I have anything else from my notes. I think we have, I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to with item 53. Well, I, I'd like to say is that with shoddy police work, the crime scene was messy. Um, I think they were it was above their pay grade. If they were, if it's a straight shot with investigation, I'm, I'm. They should have stayed in it. I mean, it is, it, they should have looked hard. I mean, there's so many things they didn't do. It just wasn't thorough. All right. Anybody else? Final thoughts? Nope. I just, um, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm glad you uh, brought this up because I had not really paid much attention to item 53 at all. But after reading this part in your book tonight and then going through all the reports, it was like, 
whoa, it's it's much bigger than what I mean. I I didn't even glance at it until now. So thank you. I think that we need to actually make a post about this in the group and see if we can get some more people to kind of brainstorm in regards to this. Okay. All right. Um, Ann or Dan, any final thoughts here before we shut this one down? I'll stop this recording soon here. I don't have any thoughts. You guys have done a great job covering everything. And thank you for your hard work continuing to investigate the Crowley case. Thank you, my friend. Was William ever able to join us? No, he was not able to, but um, I do hope to get him on um, on our next podcast, which we will be covering. We'll be staying on this chapter, um, and we'll be talking more. That chapter kind of jumps around, so in our next show... Um, we will be focusing more on item 57, how we even get to know that there was an item 57, and then we'll talk more about all of the strange things with item 57. So I do look forward oh. to, to that one. That'll be a fun show. We might have to break that up into a couple shows. I think so. I think so. I mean, you know, I had, I thought we would go maybe about 45 minutes, 50 minutes on this, and I think we're about at the two-hour mark. So, Oh, <laughs> I'll, good Lord. I'll go ahead and stop this recording here now. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us. And uh, don't forget, on the first of every month, we will have a new podcast. So thank you all. Hey, hey, thank you, Greg.